Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. The time is 9.01 and the date is June 20th, 2018. This is day one of the Physical Therapy Board of California's two-day meeting. And we are meeting at the Western University Rodney P. Weinberg Center, Cooper Hall at 309 East 2nd Street in Pomona, California. Can we please have roll call? Alicia Rubina, amen. Here. T.J. Watkins. Yeah. Jesus Dominguez. Present. Daniel Drummer. Present. Katarina Ellaby. Present. Tanya McMillian. Present. All members are present and we have a quorum. Thank you. And um, having taken some recent regulatory training, I was encouraged to start the meetings by reading our mission statement. So we've got that first and clear in our minds. And the mission of the Physical Therapy Board of California is to promote and protect the interests of the people of California by the effective and consistent administration and enforcement of the Physical Therapy Practice Act. And second, I'd just like to thank Dr. Sims for hosting us today. We're very happy to be here at Western University. And let's start with agenda item number three, our special order of business, and we'll turn it over to uh, our ALJ, um, Judge David B. Rosen. Rosenman. Thank you and good morning. Um, before we open the record in either of the two cases that are uh, set on the uh, agenda today, I do want to uh, make some statements and perhaps even ask some questions of board members. Um, first, I'd like to ask if any board member has not been through the process of a petition for reinstatement or a petition for reduction of penalty. All right. No show of hands. Uh, I want to remind board members that in this process they act like jurors and most importantly that they're not to make any judgment or decision until all of the evidence is in and that you can base your decision only on the evidence that has been submitted. If any board member is either familiar with one of the petitioners, aware of some facts or um, uh, information relating to a petitioner that is not part of the record that is presented here today, you must ignore that information and not let it infiltrate into your thought process. Members also act like judges. They must be fair and impartial and not be biased. And let me ask if there's any board member who feels there's a reason that they need to make a disclosure or feel that they should be recused from hearing the matter based on any particular information they may know about either of the petitioners. I see no show of hands. The order of events for each of the petitions will be as follows, although I'm open to suggestion if uh, the board president informs me otherwise. Uh, after calling the case uh, and opening the record, the uh, deputy attorney general uh, assigned to that particular case will make a presentation, and that usually includes the petition itself as well as all of the papers that were submitted in support of the petition. Then the petitioner is permitted to make a statement. Uh, that would be under oath. If the petitioner makes a statement or doesn't make a statement, the Deputy Attorney General is permitted to ask questions of the petitioner. And then I will ask board members if they have any questions. And what I normally do is start on my right and go through to see if each board member at least has the opportunity to ask questions. If you don't want to ask a question, please say that affirmatively and we'll move on to the next board member. After that, I will have board members again because sometimes something that's said after you've had your say uh, makes you think of another question you'd like. So we have board members go through twice. Then we'll have the uh, petitioner make any additional statements, the deputy attorney general make any additional uh, questions or statements, and then another opportunity for board members to question. And that's usually the, the conclusion of the hearing process. Objections may be raised. Um, I may raise objections. A petitioner is allowed to raise objections. The deputy attorney general may raise objections. If an objection is raised, I'll make a ruling and we'll uh, 
then direct the proceedings uh, to the next logical step. I'm going to ask that board members not take offense. If an objection is raised to one of your questions, it may be by a petitioner, it may be by the Deputy Attorney General, it may be by me. Um, I've sustained objections to my own questions when it's been brought to my attention that they were objectionable. So please don't take offense at that. Finally, board members have to be present through the entirety of the hearing to be able to participate in, deliber in deliberations and vote. So if, for example, you need a restroom break, uh, you need to take or make a phone call, if you step out of the room while the hearing is ongoing, you are uh, unable to engage in deliberation. If any of those things happen, simply ask me if we can take a recess and we'll do that, and then you can come back in and play a part in the entirety of the process. And uh, that's uh, what I have to say for general procedures. Let me find out if any board members have any questions, either about anything I've said or anything else about the process that I might answer at this time. I see no questions. Okay. So we will call the first case. I'm going to ask Ms. Uh, Cindy Chunfat to come down to uh, the table and to bring her materials with her, and also the Deputy Attorney General, Nicholas Schultz, to come and set up his materials. I'm going to suggest we do that before we formally open the record, so if you would, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so we will uh, open the record. This is in the matter of the petition for termination of probation of Cindy Nunez Chunfat. The Office of Administrative Hearings has assigned case number 2018-050405. And let me ask uh, first, Ms. Chunfat, if you'd identify yourself for the record by stating your name. My name is Cindy Nunez Chunfat. Good morning. Good morning. And if I could have the Deputy Attorney General please state his name for the record. Good morning, Your Honor. Nicholas Schultz, Deputy Attorney General, representing the public. Thank you. And my name is David Rosenman. I'm an administrative law judge. I've been assigned to preside over the hearing uh, in front of the full Physical Therapy Board of California. Ms. Chunfat, let me explain a few things about the process that might be helpful to you. Uh, you are the petitioner in this matter, and as a matter of law, it's your burden to establish grounds in support of your petition. Now, normally in other court proceedings, the party who has the burden of proof usually goes first. That's not what we usually do in these proceedings. Um, because uh, deputies from the Attorney General's office are usually well experienced in doing administrative hearings, I will have Mr. Schultz go forward with presenting the matter, and that may include and will likely include a presentation of the petition and its uh, supporting papers. And uh, I don't know if Mr. Schultz has a summary of any sort he intends to give. Do you? I, I do, Your Honor. All right. So we will um, proceed to have Mr. Schultz make his presentation. Then, if you want to make any statement, I will swear you in, and you can make whatever statement you would like. The uh, Deputy Attorney General has the opportunity to ask you questions, whether you make a statement or not, and each of the board members and I myself also have the opportunity to ask you questions. Um, as uh, I explained before we open the record, but I'll repeat now that we're on the record, once the, uh, you have made your statement, the Deputy Attorney General has had a chance to uh, question you. We'll then see if board members have any questions. 
and then I'll give you another opportunity to add any information that you want the board members to consider. Mr. Schultz will then have the chance to ask any additional questions he has, and board members are allowed to ask further questions. That's generally how the proceedings go. Um, once both of the petitions have been heard, the board will go into executive session, discuss their decision, and then I will prepare a written decision for the board to review and hopefully sign off on. So Ms. Chunfat, uh, you won't get a decision today. Um, generally speaking, we uh, try to have decisions to the board within 30 days, and then the board can process it and get it to you once they've finished their process. Ms. Chunfat, do you have any questions either about anything I've said or anything else about the process that I can help you with? No. All right, and I encourage you to ask questions. If something happens during the hearing, and you're not sure what it means, please ask. Excuse me, Judge, I'm not sure what happened or what that means, and I'll do my best to explain, okay? Okay, thank Very you. Very good. I should also mention in a brief discussion with Mr. Schultz before we open the record, uh, he indicated that no redactions, no editing had been made to the petition or other exhibits that are going to be presented today. On occasion, as I look through documents uh, relating to these types of matters, I'll find information that I would consider to be private or confidential under the law. And the easiest examples of that are social security numbers or driver's license numbers. If I find that in any of the exhibits that are submitted in the hearing today, I will block it out with a, with a black ink pen. Um, so technically I'm issuing an oral protective order that allows me to do that. Ms. Chunfet, do you have any question about that? No, I don't, Your Honor. All right, do you have any objection to me doing that? No. And Mr. Schultz, any objection to me doing that? No, Your Honor, thank you. Very good. All right, um, Mr. Schultz, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and if it would please the board, I'd like to give just a brief opening statement for the benefit of all of you as well as Ms. Chunfet. Um, as the representative of the public interest in this matter, the Attorney General's office believes that the petition should be denied unless, of course, the petitioner proves by clear and convincing evidence. Sure, unless the petitioner proves clearly and convincingly that she is rehabilitated and entitled to have her physical therapist license restored. By way of background information, Ms. Chun Fat was initially licensed in 2009. She has no prior disciplinary history. On January 19, 2014, Ms. Chun Fat was stopped by a California Highway Patrol officer for driving erratically with her son, a minor, as a passenger in the vehicle. The officer performed the traffic stop. Uh, petitioner admitted to drinking, displayed signs of intoxication and impairment. Ultimately, her blood alcohol level was measured to be greater than 0.15%. Petitioner was arrested for DUI, ultimately pled guilty uh, in violation of vehicle code section 23152 subdivision B and was sentenced to three years of probation. An accusation was filed in September of 2014, alleging that the petitioner was convicted of a substantially related crime, as well as uh, having failed to report the conviction. Uh, Effective May 15, 2015, this board adopted a stipulated settlement and disciplinary order placing the petitioner on probation for a period of five years. By our estimation, probation is set to expire August 15, 2020. Um, of course, the burden in this matter rests on the petitioner to prove that she is rehabilitated and, have, and to have her license restored. Uh, at this time, and with your Honor's permission, I am ready to proceed with the presentation of evidence. Go right ahead, Mr. Schultz. Thank you. Uh, so in the binder that is in front of all of you, uh, first I'll uh, identify the document behind tab number one. Tab number, this document behind tab number one is a 53-page document. You'll notice uh, bait stamps on the bottom right-hand corner of the page. This is the petition for reduction of penalty that was submitted by Ms. Chunfat in this matter. Uh, I would uh, ask that it be marked for identification and offer it into evidence at this time. Thank you. The petition is described by Mr. Schultz is marked for identification. Ms. Chunfat, do you have any objection to the board members reviewing and using the petition as evidence in the hearing today? No, I don't, Your Honor. Thank you. So, Exhibit 1 will be received in evidence. 
Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. The next document is behind tab number two. This is a three-page document. I offer this for jurisdictional purposes, and I will note that this is a notice of hearing that was sent to Ms. Chun Fat dated May 3, 2018. The document described by Mr. Schultz is marked for identification as Exhibit 2 to these proceedings. Ms. Chun Fat, do you have any objection to us using Exhibit 2 as evidence? No, I don't, Your Honor. Thank you. Exhibit 2 is received. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, next, we have a two-page document, uh, well, double-sided, behind tab number three. This is Ms. Chun Fat's acknowledgment of receipt and agreement to appear. Similarly, I offer this for jurisdictional purposes. The document described by Mr. Schultz is marked for identification as Exhibit 3 to these proceedings. Ms. Chun Fat, do you have any objection to Exhibit 3 being used as evidence? No, I don't, Your Honor. Thank you. Exhibit 3 will be received in evidence. Go ahead. Next, Your Honor, I have a single-page document behind tab number four. This is the certificate of licensure for the petitioner. I offer that at this time. The document described by Mr. Schultz is marked for identification as Exhibit 4 to these proceedings. And Ms. Chunfat, do you have any objection to this being used as evidence? No, I don't, Your Honor. Thank you. Exhibit 4 is received. Go ahead. Next, Your Honor, we have a 31-page document behind tab number five. This is a certified copy of the board's decision and order in the underlying case. And similarly, I'll note that there are bait stamps along the right side, uh, lower right side of the page. I offer that at this time. All right, and Mr. Schultz, have you compared uh, what is behind tab five to the copies that were included within the petition? I have, Your Honor. Is and there any difference other than perhaps the bait stamping? Uh, there is, Your Honor. The copy behind tab number one, the petition, uh, does not contain the endorsement of the Attorney General's office. Thank you. All right, so the document that Mr. Schultz described is marked for identification as Exhibit 5 to these proceedings. Uh, Ms. Chunfat, do you have any objection to Exhibit 5 being used as evidence? No, I don't, Your Honor. Thank you. Exhibit 5 is received in evidence. Go ahead. And finally, Your Honor, I have behind tab number 6 an 11-page document. This is the Petition for Reduction of Penalty Report. I would offer that at this time as well. All right. The document described by Mr. Schultz is marked for identification as Exhibit 6 to these proceedings. Ms. Chunfat, do you have any objection to this being used as evidence? No, I don't, Your Honor. Thank you. Exhibit 6 is received. Mr. Uh, Schultz, was uh, a set of these exhibits provided to Ms. Chunfat before today? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. All right. So, Ms. Chunfat, as I explained earlier, uh, the next step in the proceeding is to allow you to make a statement to the board, uh, provide testimony, in other words, and I'm going to ask you to please stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Good. Please be seated. And again, Ms. Chunfat, if you would state your name and spell your name for the record. Cindy Nunez Chunfat. Right. And, and Ms. Chun Chunfat, while you're testifying, keep the following things in mind. It's very common for people to be nervous. We all okay. understand that. Sometimes when people are nervous, they speak quickly. So I may ask you to slow down. And sometimes when people are nervous, the volume of their voice drops. And I need to make sure that everyone on the board can hear your statement. So please try and speak up into the microphone. And I may have to remind you to keep your voice up. Also, um, Mr. Schultz is permitted to make objection. If you hear him say objection, uh, I want you to stop your testimony. I will then make a ruling and give you instructions on how you can proceed. And with that, Ms. Chunfat, I'm sure the board would be very interested in hearing your testimony. Go right ahead. So I'm Cindy Chunfat, uh, C-H-U-N-F-A-T. And I really hope you guys consider um, early termination for this probation. Um, I've been compliant with everything thus far since I was put on probation. It's been very difficult being a single mom, trying to coordinate um, to meet all those restrictions that were placed on there, but I've been doing that. Um, I don't drink. I'm not a drinker. Um, this will never, ever, ever happen again. It was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life. Um, 
So I just really hope you guys would consider me for early termination today. All right. Anything else, Ms. Chunfat, before I see if Mr. Schultz has questions? Uh, no, there's nothing else, Your Honor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Your Honor, and good morning, Ms. Chunfat. Good morning. In your narrative statement, you wrote that you were requesting early termination in part because of the burden it imposed upon uh, your supervisor. My question is, is there any other reason, anything else you'd like the board to know as to why you're now petitioning for early termination of probation? Just, I'm working about 30, 30 miles away from where I live and having a six-year-old son, being a single mom, is just um, I'm having to cut my hours short just to meet you know, getting there on time to pick him up. Um, I do have a supervisor there currently. Um, just to be closer, if there's any emergencies, I just would really like to be a little closer to home and okay. near, near him. You also testified that you don't drink, that you're not a drinker. Uh, what is your uh, sobriety date, for lack of a better word? So just thinking back, I, I took two years off of not drinking at all. I mean, this was an impact of my life quite a bit. Uh, I was just thinking back the last time I took a, you know, two sips of a beer. I was in Panama. I don't like beer, but I did just take two sips of a beer. I think it was March was the last time that I consumed a quarter of a beer. And that would have been March of this year, 2018? Correct. What activities have you completed as part of your criminal probation with regards to substance abuse? Um, I attended the courses that were placed forth uh, through the Maximus program. Um, the Maximus program, uh, in which they had me attend um, these weekly meetings two times a week with other healthcare professionals, with um, people with addiction. I did that as well as did the um, drug testing daily, I would call in and attended that Maximus, I think, I believe it was in July, had determined that I was not a candidate, I wasn't appropriate for their program, so they took me off of that. Um, I still continue to attend the AA meetings um, and just, you know, learning about um, things that I could do to, ah, sorry, just, I'm nervous. Um, No, I think that's it, Your Honor. You were referencing attendance at AA meetings, if that Cur helps remind you. Was yes, there anything else you wanted to say about that? I was just thinking about, I mean, it's been, what, three years uh, that I attended the classes. I, went, I did everything for the state of California in order to get my license back. And then after that, um, actually the Maximus program ending in July, I did continue to attend those AA classes, I believe, until November. So a couple, three or four months after that. And, and Ms. Chunpat, I'm sorry, uh, you discontinued the AA meetings in November of which year? Of 2015. Okay. And you completed biological fluid testing for approximately three months, is that right? Correct. And uh, other than your consumption of uh, alcohol in Panama earlier this year, uh, when was the last time prior to that that you had consumed alcohol? I think um, April of last year, a glass of wine while I was out camping in Berryessa. Uh, do you intend to continue drinking if N uh, this petition is granted? No, I do not. Not even on social occasions? I would hope not, no. My only have two other questions. Um, what steps are you going to take if your license is unrestricted after after this proceeding to ensure that something like this never happens again? I I mean I I don't drink. I'm not a drinker. If someone presents you know socially with something, I deny it. Um, and just not you know drink. Um, it doesn't really appeal to me. What have you learned from this experience? Uh, I, I mean, it took a, a toll on me for quite a bit, just not having a job. And I just, 
learn, you know, life is precious. You don't, you don't ever know when something could happen. And, you know, it's the biggest mistake I've ever made. I try to convince. Let's go off the record just for a moment. Is there a technical person here? That I'd, I'd just rather have a technical person move it than her. Could, could I have you perhaps move the microphone to the right, the other direction, that way so that she's facing more towards the court reporter? That's perfect. Thank you. And let's get a, a test. Can you state your name again? Cindy Chunfat. All right. We'll see if that helps. Does that? Okay. Without... Okay. Right. And again, we need to make sure the record that's made here is as clear as possible. Okay. All right. So let's go back on the record. We've uh, done some microphone adjustments. And um, Ms. Chenfet, you were uh, in the midst of ask, answering the question of what you have learned from this experience. If you continue, please. I mean, just that life, you know, it was the biggest mistake I made in my life. Um, just knowing something is, you know, having a drink and going out there just being impaired could you know affect affected me greatly um, just just it, the whole thing is just reminding me of the reason why I drank that day um, it's in my statement and um, I was celebrating a friend's remission of cancer that day um, so had a glass of wine left this her home was pulled over I uh, never let her know that I was pulled over. Uh, a year later, she passed. Uh, she didn't make it. She died of the cancer. So just reliving this, knowing, uh, being in the healthcare field, knowing how life, uh, precious life is, it's just something I regret doing. And I've learned you know, to talk others into not doing that, even if it's just a glass of wine, um, calling an Uber, just it's affected me greatly, just that one mistake that night. Mr. Schultz, any other questions? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. Let me give board members the opportunity to ask questions. We'll start on my right, please. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming in. Um, being a single mom, I also know that um, raising children by yourself comes with a lot of challenges. And so, um, I wanted to ask you, um, when I read your written statement, mm -hmm. um, it made me feel like drinking is taboo to you. But since the incident, you've had occasions where you've still had an opportunity to drink. And so I'm just wondering why, like what, why, why was it not taboo then? So um, as far as when I had the glass of wine and when we were camping, it was a social around the campfire. We were there um, I had a glass of red wine. And then in Panama, it was mainly just for, sounds silly, uh, for a picture that we took. I just took two sips of that beer and then the rest was given to my boyfriend. So you took the for a, a, pic, a picture? Well, it was a, we were in we were in Costa Rica, then went to Panama. We had ordered, you know, two beers at the bar. Um, I took two sips of it. Do, did not like it. Do not like beer. And then the rest was given to my boyfriend. But okay. as far as I don't like, I, that's the last time I could think that I had consumed um, alcohol. How does a picture? What? How? I don't understand the relevance between drinking and taking a still shot picture so what explain to me why you needed to drink to take the picture i guess i i didn't i just i mean i tasted it and i took two sips of it and that's the extent of that and i mean he took a picture to send to his family that we were in panama there were two beers that said panama on them okay okay thank you thank you all right next board member Good morning, Ms. Trenfat. 
Um, I, I just had a, a couple of quick questions for you. The first is test. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. Um, good morning, good Mr. Morning. Fett, thank you. Um, I had two quick questions for you. The first is, um, in your, your statement, you said that uh, for the most part, um, your supervisors don't have a problem coming in to see you, but it's more you feel it's a, a burden to their, their time and effort. Yeah, they're driving up to, two, they were, um, I just recently, June 11th, started back at my old work where there's a supervisor there daily, um, but the supervisors were driving up to two hours to come supervise me. Um, and I would, you know, occasionally they weren't able to make it, so I was not able to go into work that day. They would let me know, you know, a couple days in advance that they weren't going to be able to come in. But driving, I just felt, I don't know, I felt bad having them come to supervise me and then go back to their, their work. But they haven't told you that they would not continue to do this. Is that um, right? Well, the, I went back to my other work, Apple Valley, where Lori Harrison's there daily. Um, I was told at the Oaks where I was that, um, you know, they're preparing for state survey that one of the supervisors wasn't going to be able to make it. Um, I, knowing that I could go back to Apple Valley where I currently work, it's a commute, but knowing that I have that full time hours to work, I chose to go back there full time instead of not knowing if when the supervisor was going to be able to come to supervise me and missing out time to work and get that um, income. Okay, thank you. Um, and really the, the last question is um, in regards to, to your letters of, of support, um, one from, I apologize, I've already forgotten their names, uh, but I, I believe you had two. Uh, Lori Harrison okay. is my current supervisor. Um, both of your letter writers, are they, I, I didn't find it in, in their actual, the, the text of the letter, but both of your letter writers are aware of the, the background in your case and the reasons for probation? Yes. Okay. Yes, they are. Okay. That's it, Your Honor, for now. Thank you. Thank you. Next board meeting. Good morning. Good morning. You say that you have um, grown since the beginning of this process, and I wanted to just get an idea, looking back, um, what made you decide to drink and drive that day? What were you thinking? I clearly wasn't. I mean, I was in the right state, um, but I was going into, I had to work the next day. So it was Sunday, and I had to be at work the next day, so I had to drive home. Is that something that you did often? No, never. Mm -hmm. And um, as I understand, it took you a while to respond to the board? Um, well, no, I responded right away mm -hmm. um, within the time frame and went to court for the California. Or, and then my lawyer, I mean, it, it's my fault. I should have checked in, in on it. Um, he didn't respond. Um, I think it was six days late of the ruling from California. Okay. Um, how long were you in the Maximus program? I believe three months. Three months. Like May, June, and then I think they it was mid-July. Mid and how many months of biological testing did you complete? This, the same. Okay. And how open are you and have you been with family, friends, and coworkers about what's happened to you? Um, all my coworkers are aware, um, most of my friends, family, but I have not told. So, I mean, I'm embarrassed. It's, it, I put my son's life at risk, um, so I haven't told um, some family members. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Next board member. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Just could, okay. So I want to clear up a few things. So the reason why you're asking to have this period shortened is because you are inconvenienced by all the burden that is placed upon you. Am I correct in asking that? 
assuming that? Yes. So how much of this do you take responsibility for? For having brought this life situation upon your life? Yeah, yes. sorry, hold on. We have to use the microphone, otherwise board members can't hear the answer. And I'll just ask the court reporter to keep, to the extent that you can't understand or get a full answer, ask the witness to say the thing again. Move it back. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay, better sound, huh? Sorry, what was your... Um... I was asking um, your level of responsibility. How much of this do you own? I take full responsibility for that day, that mistake that I made that night, um, so 100%. So let's go through that, just as an exercise. So on this particular day, you had one glass of wine, jumped into a car. You just said that. So, oh, so we were, it was, there was a football game, it was a 49er football game, there was people over. Um, I had my son running around after them, I, being a single, you know, trying to keep up with them. I didn't really eat much that day, just snacking here and there, knowing that my friend that has passed um, was in remission. Um, I sell, you know, she poured me a, a big glass, a considerably big glass of wine before I left um, to celebrate, you know, her being cancer free. So I, I did cheers, everyone was there. It was a moment to celebrate at that time, um, and it didn't. I, dro I drove an hour and a half, so I mean, it, it didn't really feel the effects until after I was pulled over, you know, an hour and a half later. So, so this was a random event. Last it was random. It um, was like one of those once in a lifetime moments where you drank on this particular day because you never do that. Well. So drinking and driving, never. No, I mean, this was the only time, but before then, before this whole incident, you know, occasionally I was a social drinker. You know, you go out, uh, have a glass of wine with dinner. That's to the extent, not driving, ever. Um, so this, yes, having my car, having my son, being, you know, an hour and a half away, um, this was a random and event. So after you heard on the clinical, diag after Maximus, that you were inappropriate as a candidate. What did you think? And what do you still think about that result? I, I learned a great deal from attending the meetings that I went to the, twice a week um, with the other healthcare professionals that were there. Um, I, I never considered myself, you know, myself an addict. I've never been addicted to anything. Um, but I, I do think it was a a good thing that I went through the program, um, taking responsibility for what I did. So I, I do feel that at the end when, you know, I think the psychiatrist and the psychologist wrote letters saying they felt I was not an appropriate candidate um, because I just didn't fit what the other healthcare professionals were going through as far as their addictions and what they're still dealing with trying to recover. But you personally, how do you feel about where you at? How do you consider yourself, your relationship with alcohol? I mean, I feel great. I'm not, I don't drink. Like I said, that, I'm sorry, that was kind of random. The picture that we just took, it was just a random thing just to take the, the two sips. Um, but by no means am I going back to drinking or, you know, it, it, a situation comes up, I, I, it, it's not even a question, I'm, I don't drink. Most of the time, because in two, on two occasions you did not. Cor correct, I mean, we were, we were camping. Well, it doesn't matter the setting. You see, right. you emphatically uh, denounce drinking, and yes. then you drink. And okay. for someone that has taken one sip, big glass at a particular event, got into a calm, and created life circumstances that brought a lot of burden in your life and in your son's life, I would just think for two seconds that I would never want to see a drink again. Right. 
So there's something more compelling here for me. And I want to ask you my final question is, what do you think is driving, you know, that you still reach in light of this situation? Boyfriend, environment, all these things are actual factors you've been through, Maximus, or you understand all the trigger spaces for this to happen. So, I want you to just give me a pretty simple indicator of what it is that triggers you to say yes in light of this life situation that you're in the middle of. What triggers me to say yes? To the to drink, yes. Even social, okay. in, under any circumstance. I don't think, I mean, my, my son's life and just being there for him and having, providing for him, I don't think, just going through all this, I don't think I would ever say yes. But you have since. That's what my point is. My point is that you have on two occasions in light of the situation. And the one was, uh, the major one that impacted your life was right. one drink. You've inf you said that. Now there's yeah. a bigger drink, right? But if you are impacted like that with one drink, and then you go to Panama, now the yeah. next event was in, at the lake where you had another glass of wine. The, the, two years before. Two years before. Correct. But that was after this, this event. The, the most often was when I was, at, my son wasn't with me when I was in Panama. No, 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 I'm not oh. talking about that. I'm just talking about the drinking. You but, see, the, the, what I'm, uh, the, the exploration here is that there's something around here that we can actually see. And the thing that we see is that there's still something compelling you, whether it's social pressure or whatever, or environment, that is triggering you to say yes, regardless of this life situation. I'm yeah. sorry, but you yeah. have not posed the question, so oh, I cannot so you're, have Ms. No. Chunfat respond to a comment. Okay, so, so let let's ask the question. Board members, we're not here to have a conversation. It's a question and answer format, and you, you've just made a statement. Okay. So please pose a question that Ms. Chunfat can respond to. What, what have you identified as your primary triggers that will absolutely get you to take a drink? I don't think it absolutely will get me to take a drink. Um, I, I don't drink. It, that was just a silly, like I mentioned, the, the Panama. Uh, two sips, not like of the bottle, that's, that's all I had. I don't feel that I would have drank the whole bottle of beer. Can you hear me okay? I mean, I, I'm sorry, I just, I'm, I don't think something would trigger me to, to get drunk or get, to get impaired um, or even now to take a sip. Thank you. Let's move on to the next board member. There we go. Thank you for coming, braving this board, <laughs> taking the time to, to come down from Petaluma sit in front of us to, to go through this. Um, a couple of questions. You told us that you continued to attend AA through November of 2015. Was, yes. Was part of that because, or was that in, in part because of your trying to reinstate your driver's license, that you were required for a certain period to it, go through AA meetings? I, just, I mean, it was a long time ago. I'm sorry, I should have looked back. Um, they reinstated it to and from work when I got the job in October. So I, I, I was off of work for roughly five, five months, I believe, since I started the um, probation. So I just continued to go because I had a sponsor um, going through you know, the steps. So I continued to attend and be there for the people that I have met through the process that I met in AA. Okay. So even though Maximus had determined that you weren't a candidate for, for alcohol abuse, substance abuse rehabilitation, because 
they determined you were no long, you, that you were not an addict, that you didn't have that need, but you continued to go to AA mostly for the support? Well, I went there, I met people while I was going there, and um, just, sorry, talking to, to Moni, the probation monitor, it was a good idea to, you know, to continue, and I, I did enjoy going, I learned um, just how people's lives have been affected by, you know, being addicts, and I just thought it was a good experience to, to continue to go, and I didn't go, like, I, every day, I would go, you know, when I didn't have my son, we, I split them 50-50, um, and I, I remember thinking, okay, I need to, you know, go back to, to doing other things, you know, going to the gym and doing other things that I had stopped doing when I was going to these meetings. So I, I believe it was right around November before the holidays um, that I stopped attending. Do you have shared custody of your son? Um, we, we didn't go through court. We just. Okay. Um, said, you know, 50-50. So but. these events, did they have an impact on on the care of your son? Um, they did. His father had taken me to court for, um, not for the custody, but to get money um, after the events because he was angry. Um, we, we, we get along perfectly fine now. We, you know, I, I probably have him 75, 25. He had a new baby, so I'm, he remarried, has a baby, and he kind of is, has come to the conclusion that, you know, I am a good mom, and it was a mistake I made, so. Okay. Glad that it's working out. Um, one other um, question that I had for you is, uh, one of the conditions of your probation is that you notify your patients. Correct. Uh, of, your, of your license status. Can you just walk me through how you do that? So um, when I get an evaluation, or if I take on a, a patient that's already been evaluated, I introduce myself, let them know who I am, um, what I'm there to do, and then I let them know I have it with me, the paper. Um, I present it to them, and it, the paper just has a statement that my license is put on probation. A lot of the times, I like to explain, you know, what happened. You know, that I was pulled up for a DUI, um, and at times they they don't even ask. They they say, nope, that's you know, and they sign off, they say that's your thing that happened on the weekend, it has nothing to do with your um, abilities to work with me, so, but for those that do want to know about it, I do explain it to them, it's just, it's hard reliving that moment, because I did lose the person I was celebrating, um, my friend that passed, so just reliving that every time I do a new evaluation or see a new patient, it's just been hard. Have you ever had a patient say that after you present that, that they don't want to work with you? No, everyone's wor uh, worked with me. It, it was difficult uh, working in a skilled nursing facility, post-acute facility. A lot of the patients aren't their own DPOAs, so I would have to call a family member or whoever's listed to make sure it's okay for me to treat them because cognitively they're not able to to answer you know, or know what I'm, the probation's about. So. In those cases, they just get pushed back, you know, to the next day if I'm not able to get a hold of their DPOA. But that's been the only issue that I've come across, or it's, or it's assigned to another therapist. One other um, question came to my head. This seems to be, what have you learned about decision making? And in part, professional, professional decision making because put your, your PT license on, on the line. It's on and, the line. Right. Um, what have you learned about that? I mean, it's just it's overwhelming to think that I, I did this, this event that I did. Um, I've learned that, I mean, I, I keep just thinking of being, uh, my son, I just keep envisioning me getting in the car with my son and putting his, his life at risk and others on the road at risk. And I just, I regret it. I, it's something that I have to live with for the rest of my life, just thinking back that I have done that. I mean, he's the most, I mean, I live for, for him, you know? So I've just learned I can't, I'm sorry. Just, 
Thank you. Other questions? Good morning, Ms. Chen Pat. Good morning. Is the volume okay? Okay. Um, thank you for coming before the board today. I have a few questions for you regarding your testimony and uh, the reports that were provided with. Um, could you tell me which step in AA most resonated with you? Well, the thing is, I, like I said, I went to November. I didn't go through all the steps, but just time. I mean, it's been three years. So like right now being in front of you guys, I can't even think of the steps. Okay. So I apologize. I have no questions. So that's okay. Don't worry. Okay. You mentioned that in your um, request for termination of probation, that the main reason you're seeking early termination is because of the burden that the people who supervise you have to ensure that you can practice. But the role of the board is to ensure public protection and the hearing today is to see if you have been rehabilitated and if we're comfortable releasing you to practice uh, with the public with a full unrestricted license. And I would love to hear a little bit more about not so much the burden it has placed on people have to supervise you, but more so on the burden it has placed on you as an individual. Well, just not having the income to, or the, the to pay bills um, was hard. You know, borrowing money from family members when I didn't have a job, when I would call and say, you know, like, I can't come this week, having to pay bills. Um, it's just been very hard trying to get that extra income. And if I'm granted, um, you know, termination or modification, I would like to work and get a little bit more. Right now, I'm, my pay isn't what it should be, and um, I would like to work closer to home and do home health, something that I could be flexible with so I could be there for my son and be in the area and be flexible with my schedule. Um, so it's just been stressful trying to make ends meet, not knowing if I'm gonna, you know, now, I, like I said, I just started back at July 11th, now I'm full time, and it kind of took a little bit of pressure of knowing that I'll have some income, but I never, you know, you never know if Lori, you know, gets sick, goes on vacation, I, I just won't have a supervisor for that duration of time, and so it's, it's been hard. Thank you, I have no further questions. Let me ask if any other board members have questions before we go back to any further statement from this. Okay, so um, I believe you. I believe you when you say that um, you love your work. Um, as a single mom, I, I feel you, I, I know you love your son. My problem is, and I need you to answer this for me, um, have said emphatically and adamantly that you do not drink. But that picture that you took, sipping beer, if it landed on social media somewhere, or in Monty's hands, or it was passed around this horseshoe to these board members, how would you explain that? Because that picture would not say, I don't drink. Right, and um, the, the, and the picture wasn't of me drinking it. It wasn't. It was, a, and I, it was of me just holding it um, with, you know, it was two, it was in Panama. Um, it was my boyfriend's, I took two sips and, you know, but yeah, I mean, it, it would look like I had consumed or if it were to be placed on social media. Um, and I don't, so I don't drink, so. Thank you. I had one more, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, Ms. Trenfat, if your son was sitting up here at the table with us, 
what would you tell him about your decision that day um, and the risk that you placed yourself in, him certainly and, and, and the public? And how, what would you tell him to convince him that this will never happen again? Yeah, I would just, I, I hope he never finds out, but I mean, he's going to eventually and know that, I mean, he was too young at the time. Um, he knows how much I love, he just had surgery last month. Um, so we were in the ICU um, for two days and I just, his life has just means so much to me. And I, I just would hate for him to think that, you know, mama didn't make a good decision that day and put his precious life at risk. Um, so I'd, I would have a hard time telling him I did that. Um, but I'd tell him, you know, people make decisions at some points in their life that when they're impaired, um, it's a lesson that I learned and hopefully he learns from the mistake I made and will never be put in that situation or placed in that event where he may do the same thing, knowing what I went through. I just hope you guys really consider me for early termination or some type of modification. I, I, I'm passionate about my job, uh, the restrictions placed on there. You know, I'm not allowed to supervise PTAs or students. I love teaching um, when I had students before. Just love engaging with them, having them learn from me and showing them what physical therapy is about and not being able to do that. Um, is something that you know I would enjoy doing um, and just being able to work closer to home and having a flexible schedule um, I would greatly appreciate if you guys would just take it into consideration to either terminate or make or modifications to the, the uh, order decision and order Thank you, Mr. any questions Mr. Schultz I do your honor Ms. Chunfat, you have insisted that you don't drink. Wouldn't it be a much more fair and accurate statement to say that you are, in fact, a social drinker? I disagree. I mean, I've been around people that have been drinking around me, and, you know, I don't drink. I, I haven't, I'm just trying to think the last time that people, I mean, they know my situation, my friends, that I hang out with so they don't pressure me or you know if there's something out there I I don't go for they don't pour me a drink if someone I don't is, doesn't know I just say no thank you but that's not what you did in Panama correct correct in fact you were taking a picture posing holding the drink and there was no need for you whatsoever to consume alcohol that day correct correct I want to go back to the underlying incident January uh, where you were stopped by a CHP officer. How old was your son that day? Two and a half. Okay. And you haven't told him about the incident, even though he's grown in age three. since then? He might have just turned three, sorry. Um, no, he's only six, and I, I don't want to, I mean, I, he's gonna find out, he's gonna know, I just, he doesn't understand. Okay. I want to ask you more about what happened prior to your traffic stop. What exactly did you consume that day? What I want to know is how much wine, how big was that glass, and what type of wine were you consuming? Um, it was red wine, and I just remember it being a, a big, I know, you know, wine glasses. It was a, a big, big wine glass. Um, it might have been equivalent to maybe two. Fill it up quite a bit and you know trying to get home and I drank it not having that much food in my system just running around 
chasing after you know the kids, but it was a considerably a, a large, oversized glass of wine. Okay, so maybe more fair to say two glasses poured into one. I, I possibly. Okay. Um, How much time elapsed from your first sip of wine to your last sip of wine? Um, I was trying to get home, so I. I it was pretty quick. I. Within, I would say, I don't, I can't remember that, but 15, 20 minutes. It's pretty quick that I just drank it to drink, to celebrate, and get home. And then you chose to drive. Yes. Did you wait at all between ending your drinking and then getting behind the wheel? Just to say goodbye to everyone that was there. It was a, like I said, it was a football slash celebration of her being cancer free, I would say no more than maybe 30 minutes. After you stopped consuming Just wine. Just to okay. gather, get all my belongings, toys, things that I had brought over. So it would be fair to say then that from the moment you started drinking wine, it was about 50 minutes to maybe an hour later that you started driving. Correct. Okay. Now. I'm trying to think back. Uh, do you have anything you want to add to your statement there? No, I mean, I stopped to get gas. I was trying to think of a time, 10, 15 minutes there, and then home. Okay. Now, you are aware that driving with a blood alcohol content of 0.08 or above is uh, presumptive intoxication in the state of California? Correct. And your blood alcohol level was approximately twice that. They, sorry, they, they did do the breathalyzer at the scene. Uh, they, I don't know if it's on there. They did the breathalyzer at the scene, and it was, he wasn't able to read it. So when I got to the jail, they asked if they could take my blood, and I said yes. And it showed. But he had another reading at the scene that was not that high, but within the course of another you know, 30, 40 minutes, of when they took the blood, it did come up 0.15. Okay. That, to the best of your recollection, one of the readings was 0.15. Correct. Okay. And two glasses of wine, only two, got you to that level of blood alcohol content? I'm going to sustain my own objection. It's argumentative. She's already testified to both portions of that. Question. I'll rephrase, Your Honor, if I may. Ms. chun -Fat, since we've had a chance to talk a little bit more about the details of that incident, is it at all possible that perhaps you consumed, cons consumed more than just the two glasses of wine in that one wine glass? I, I can't measure, I'm just, I'm sorry, it was, it's a, it was a large wine glass. Um, I don't know if they call, I, I'm sorry, I don't even know the terminology of these. It was, a, was it a gob? I don't know. It was, I remember it being a, very large glass of wine, and she filled it almost to the top. So it was, it could have been equivalent to, I, ca I can't measure it, but two, I, I don't know. Okay. Just a few more questions. Um, when you were participating in AA, how many classes were you required to attend each week? I did. I did four, starting off, and I'm sorry, I don't think that's part of the, I don't know if I have any of all the sign-in sheets, and then it went down to uh, going to three, and then by November I was only attending up to one time a week. So approximately how many AA classes do you calculate that you attended? Oh, I had about three or four sheets filled. Of signatures. I, I mean, it must have been over. I mean, close to. I don't know, a hundred. I don't. I can't. I can't recall the exact number, but it was quite a few. Okay. My uh, last set of questions is with regards to uh, your discharge from Maximus after the clinical diagnostic evaluation. Mm -hmm. So 
you are not required to complete the substance abuse rehabilitation program, is that right? Uh, say it, your question again? I'll rephrase um, it. You were discharged from Maximus. You didn't have to complete that. Correct. Okay. Um, but you still had other requirements of probation. For example, you had to have a worksite monitor, correct? Correct. And the requirements that you abstain from alcohol or controlled substances remained, correct? Um, that did not remain. Uh, the letter they provided. And that did not remain. They said, you know, speaking with, sorry, Monty's behind me. Um, and speaking with him, I had quarterly meetings with him. He, after uh, Maximus said I was no longer a candidate, he said I could resume, you know, but I did not uh, for, two, like I said, two years after. Um, but that was not a requirement after I was let go of the Maximus program. It was taken off. No further questions. See if board members have any final questions. Just to clarify, for to reinstate your driver's license, were you required to attend AA meetings? Correct. And, a and an, another class, I think it was weekly, to uh, a first offenders class, I believe it was. A first offenders class. And how long was the requirement for your driver's license to be reinstated fully? that you had to attend the AA meetings? I believe it was three months. Three months. Sorry, I don't have the exact, uh, yeah, three. I believe it was three months, because I, I did receive it to go back to my, yeah. Like, sorry, I didn't, wasn't prepared with the calendar and knowing the dates, but I believe it was three months, three years to six months, maybe. And your being enrolled in Maximus required a certain number of AA meeting attendances as well, right? Uh, see, I'm looking back, I don't think that was a requirement for Maximus. It was an option to go to the AA. The requirement was to go to the two times a week health care meetings and to do the drug testing. Got it. Thank you. Ms. Chunkford, I do have a question. Uh, to begin the Maximus program, did you sign uh, a contract relating to the behavior that you would abide by while under the program? I believe so, yes. Did that contract include your agreement that you would not uh, imbibe alcohol while you were in the program? Correct. When you were released from Maximus, is it your understanding they told you you were no longer bound by that contract term? Correct aware that there is also a term of your probation to the board that you abstain completely from use of alcohol? I saw, thinking back and speaking with Moni, the probation officer, I had saw, I saw that and I had questioned it because at one point during our quarterlies, maybe two quarterlies after, he said, are you still abstaining? Which two quarterlies before he said it was dropped. So I asked, I said, are you sure that's still on the probation and he looked into it and said something about an email from Maximus. He went back to look and got back to me and said, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that's no longer on there. So I did question it because I did see it on there. And I, oh. Any other Sean Fett, I want to thank you very much for coming in and making your presentation to the board. Mr. Schultz, very much appreciate your presentation as well. And at this point, we'll consider the record closed in this matter. We're going to take a recess. Your, your Honor, yes, sir. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to ask, would the board like closing argument from either myself or Ms. John Fett on this matter, if appropriate? We're back on the record. Mr. Schultz is uh, required whether closing argument is uh, is allowed. Um, it is, and uh, let me ask if the president of the board would like to closing argument. All right. In that case, we'll permit closing argument. Go ahead, Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Your Honor.
Members of the board, as I mentioned at the outset, the position of the Attorney General's office in this matter is that the petition should be denied unless the petitioner meets her high burden in this matter. Now, the legal standards are set forth in section 2661.7 subdivision D, and I won't recite them all, um, but some of the things that this board should consider are the activities of the petitioner since disciplinary action was taken, as, yes, your honor, as well as her rehabilitative efforts. Now, admittedly, there is evidence before you that Ms. Chun-Fat has been successful in many aspects of her probation. She was discharged from Maximus, the clinical diagnostic evaluation came back in her favor. Uh, she did complete biological fluid testing when required to do so, and she did complete uh, many AA classes. Um, arguably, there is evidence before this board to grant the peti petition and to terminate probation early. Interestingly, uh, today's testimony of Ms. Chun Fat does raise some questions. Uh, for example, Ms. Chun Fat's insistence that she does not drink over and over and over. What I submit that that reflects a lack of insight that one would be looking for in determining whether to grant the petition for early termination of probation. In addition, Evidence has come to light in today's proceeding that Ms. Chun Fat apparently had uh, a misunderstanding with regards to the distinction between the contract she had signed with Maximus and the requirements of probation. But the evidence is quite clear that Ms. Chun Fat did consume alcohol while on probation in violation of condition number 32 of the board's disciplinary order. So the board will have to weigh all of this evidence and determine the right outcome. But it is clear that when all things are considered, taking into account the hardship imposed on Ms. Chun Fat, the protection of the public is obviously the board's paramount concern. And given Ms. Chun Fat's lack of insights in some areas, there is reason to believe, I submit, that allowing her to continue on probation and continue her rehabilitation is the proper outcome in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Chunfat, any concluding comments you'd like to make to the board? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Just regarding that, um, sorry, the number 32, I, I did, if it's the one saying I'm not supposed to consume after Maximus, I, I don't have the, I mean, it's on the email. I have, you know, emails back and forth with the probation monitor um, and Maximus that, to my understanding, was that no longer was part of my probation. Um, if I would have known, I would have never uh, took, you know, the sips of alcohol in Panama. Thank you very much, Mr. Chung. At this time, we'll consider the matter to be under submission and the record will be closed. Mr. Chung, Mr. Schultz, there's an information sheet that the court reporter will complete that you may want to take with you if anyone wants to order a transcript.
Present to my right is probation monitor, Monty Martin, who we intend to call as a witness in this case. Thank you, Mr. Judge. My name is David Rosenman. I'm an administrative law judge from the Office of Administrative Hearings in Los Angeles. And I've been assigned to preside over this matter with the Physical Therapy Board of California. Um, Ms. Kolbrak, even though you may have been present for the prior petition hearing, I want to uh, make sure that this record is complete. And I want to explain some aspects about this process that might be helpful for you. Um, the burden of proof is on you to establish that there's grounds for your probation to be terminated. Um, in many court proceedings, but not today, the person with the burden of proof would go first. I'm gonna have Mr. Gotcha go first in presenting evidence today because he's more experienced with presenting the documentation that gets us all here today. Uh, so we'll go through that process, Mr. Gotcha, and uh, tell us about documents that you'd like us to be aware of, and then I'll ask you if you have any objection to particular documents being used as part of the hearing process today. Um, once Mr. Gotcha has made his presentation, uh, Mr. Gotcha, it would be, uh, I'm, I'm looking for input here, I would uh, suggest perhaps that the petitioner have the chance to go forward with her statement, and then you've indicated a witness that you can take your witness after that. Does that sound all right with you? Yes, I actually think that would be appropriate. All right. And uh, Ms. Colbrick, as uh, you saw with the prior matter, you'll be given a chance to make a statement under oath. Once you've given your statement, uh, Mr. Gotcha may have some questions for you, called cross-examination, and then board members may have questions for you as well. I'll go through the board members twice to give them a chance to uh, ask all questions that uh, come to their mind. And then I'll give you another chance to add to your statement if there's anything else that occurs to you that you'd like to add. Uh, Mr. Gotcha has the opportunity to ask for the questions have that chance as well. Are there any questions that you have that I can answer for you at this time, Ms. Colson? Um, in the beginning, you said probation. This is actually for reinstatement. I just want to make sure that's clear. I, it is clear. Okay. If okay. I have spoke, I apologize. Okay. The petition is I for... I just want to make sure. <laughs> Thank you. So I would like to be clear. The petition is for reinstatement of a revoked license. Thank you. Any other questions that you have at this time? No. Once the hearing is over, the board will go into executive session, a private session to deliberate, and uh, they'll give me instructions on how they'd like to have the decision written up, and then I write it and I send it back to them. Uh, it's likely to be some period of time. Uh, I have, I believe, 30 days, although I hope to take less than that. Um, and then the board gets to review and determine whether they want to sign off or any changes. So it's likely to be uh, a month or more. Uh, 
redactions or editing that's been made in some of the documents, and I see that we do have a redaction in Exhibit 2. Uh, I appreciate the effort to do that. The redacted copies that are provided to me will become the exhibits, the formal exhibits of the proceedings. Uh, board members may have unredacted copies that they were given to prepare for today's proceeding. They're certainly free to uh, have access to that information. However, the redacted copies will be the official exhibits. If I see any information in a document that should be redacted and has not been, I will uh, black it out and edit out that information as well. Go ahead. Exhibit three, for jurisdictional purposes only, uh, if APO 8 and 10 are the scheduling requests for the June hearing date today with Los Angeles OAH, ask that be marked for notification and admitted. The documents described by Mr. Godshed are marked as Exhibit 3 to these proceedings. Ms. Colbreck, any objection, please? No. Thank you. Exhibit 3 is received in evidence. Exhibit 4 is the notice of hearing for the March 22, 2018 hearing. Um, this was a hearing that was continued uh, at Ms. Colbreck's request and by board vote. Ask that those exhibits be marked for identification for jurisdictional purposes to show up here in June and ask those be admitted for uh, in, in, in evidence. All right, the documents described by council are marked for identification as exhibit four to these proceedings. Ms. Colbreck, any objection? No. Thank you. Exhibit four is received. Exhibit 5 is the accusation and decision and order in case number 1B-2013-737. Which led to the revocation of Ms. Colbrack's license. Asked this to be marked for identification and admitted into evidence. The documents described by counsel are marked for identification as Exhibit 5 to these proceedings. Ms. Colbrack, any objection to the no. opinions? And Exhibit 5 is received. Let me ask Mr. Gottschett, is there any significant difference between Exhibit 5 and the copies of the same documents that were attached to the petition? No, I, I didn't actually uh, take the, the copies that were attached to the petition and put them in this binder. The only copy of the decision is the copy that's in Exhibit 5. Thank you. Right, go ahead. Uh, exhibit 6 is the accusation and decision and order in case number 1B-2006-64685, which placed the petitioner's license on probation um, in 2006. Um, ask that be marked for identification and entered into evidence. The document described by counsel is marked for identification as Exhibit 6 to these proceedings. Ms. Colbrick, any objection? No. Thank you. Exhibit 6 is received. Exhibit 7 is Petition for Reinstatement of Revoked License, which was filed by a petitioner and received by the board. She signed it October 30th of 2017. It contains a list or a letter from her, a narrative statement at the end on page HEO 51, as well as uh, her employment status in HEO 50. Uh, and then I'd ask that we work for identification and evidence. The documents described by counsel are marked for identification as Exhibit 7 to these proceedings. Ms. Colbreck, any objection? No. Thank you. Exhibit 7 is received. Exhibit 8 is a letter of recommendation by Russell R. Lee, physical therapist, that was attached to petitioner's petition as set forth in Exhibit 7 in support of her petition. Ask this be marked for notification and moved into evidence. The document described by counsel is marked as Exhibit 8 to these proceedings. Ms. Colbrick, any objection? Yes. What's the objection? Um, the, to omit that letter from my packet. And why would you like that to happen? He is no longer uh, the PT. He's retired. He's unavailable. Mr. Gottschalk, your position on the objection? We would object uh, to the exclusion of this document. This was attached to the petitioner's initial petition to this board and became the subject of an investigation of whether this letter was forged. Um, my understanding is, uh, of this is that she is trying to withdraw this letter so that she can circumvent that investigation. Um, we'll be presenting the evidence uh, as we go through this case. We've asked it to be admitted into evidence as part of our initial petition packet. Right. So, um, Ms. 
Colbrack, your objection to having Exhibit 8 received in evidence is overruled. Uh, it was part of the process that gets you here today. And it's my understanding that to be able to submit a petition of this type to the board, it must include a certain number of letters of reference. So in essence, it qualified you to be able to file the petition. Uh, if you want to address aspects of this particular letter in your testimony, you're free to do that. However, the objection to it being received or the request for it to be excluded uh, will be denied the objection to the rule and Exhibit 8 is received in evidence. Go ahead. Exhibit 9 is a letter of recommendation from physical therapist Antonio O. Torres, which was also attached to petitioner's initial petition in Exhibit 7 in October of 2017, asked to be marked for identification and evidence. The document is described by counsel as marked for identification as Exhibit 9 to these proceedings. Any objection? No. Thank you. Exhibit 9 is received in evidence. Exhibit 10 is the final report of uh, probation monitor Monty Martin testifying later today, asked this to be marked for identification and received with evidence as administrative hearsay. All right, the document described by counsel is marked for identification as Exhibit 10 to these proceedings. Ms. Colbrack, Mr. Gottschett has asked that this be received as administrative hearsay, so I want to take a moment to explain what that means. I'll do my best, many lawyers don't understand this, maybe some judges don't understand but uh, it's a reference to a government code section, 11513 subdivision C or D, that talks about the types of evidence that can be used in an administrative hearing. Hearsay evidence is allowed to be used in administrative hearings, but for limited purposes. It can't be the basis for a factual finding, but it can be used to supplement or explain other evidence. So um, the position that Mr. Gottsched is taking in offering the document into uh, evidence at these proceedings is that he's acknowledging it's a hearsay document uh, it's prepared by someone outside of the hearing and wasn't necessarily prepared under the penalty of perjury. Um, but he's offering it to supplement or explain other evidence. Do you have any objection to this document being received under those limitations? No. Exhibit 10 will be received as administrative hearsay. Go ahead. Exhibit 11 is a declaration from Russell R. Lee, signed under penalty of perjury at pages 68 through 72. Ask this be marked for identification and moved into evidence. The document described by counsel is marked for identification as Exhibit 11 to these proceedings. Ms. Colbrack, is there any objection to this being received in evidence? No. 11 is received. Uh, following the hearing in March, or during the hearing in March of 2018, new letters of recommendation were submitted by the respondent, uh, and so that is what's contained in Exhibit 12. Uh, and so it's a title page uh, to that, stating that she wished to submit additional recommendation letters. So I'd ask that that be marked for notification, Exhibit 12, page AGO 73. The document described by counsel is marked for identification as Exhibit 12 to these proceedings. Ms. Colbrecht, any objection to this? No. Thank you. Exhibit 12 is received. The new letters of recommendation are set forth at Exhibit uh, 13, Exhibit 14, and Exhibit 15. So Exhibit 13 is the letter of recommendation from Les Dietes, S-T-Y-A-E-I, physical therapist at AGO 74. The document described by counsel is marked for identification as Exhibit 13 to these proceedings. Any objections, Mr. Colbert? No. Thank you. Exhibit 13 is received. Exhibit 14, Your Honor, is a letter of recommendation from a physical therapist, Ron Seitz, S-E-I-T-Z. Ask that this be marked for identification and moved into evidence. The document described by counsel is marked for identification as Exhibit 14 to these proceedings. Any objections? No. Exhibit 15 is a letter of recommendation from Andrea Howard, H-O-W-A-R-T-H. Ask that be marked for identification and moved evidence. The document described by counsel is marked for identification as Exhibit 15 to these proceedings. Any objections? No. Thank you. Exhibit 15 is received. Response.
respondent also provided a list uh, following that or during that March hearing of additional professional references. Some of those people also provided the letters that are in exhibits uh, 13, 14, and 15. Um, asked that be marked and for identification and moved the next. The document described by counsel is marked by identification as exhibit 16 to these proceedings. Any objection? No. And then finally, Exhibit 17 is the uh, final supplemental report of probation monitor Monty Martin, who called uh, the letter writers that were provided in March of 2018, as well as calling some of the individuals on the personal, personal reference list, asked this be marked for identification, and moved into evidence as administrative hearsay. Uh, same argument as Exhibit 10. The document described by counsel is marked for identification as Exhibit 17 to these proceedings. And again, Ms. Colbrack, Mr. Gotcha is requesting that I receive this on those limitations. I can use it to supplement or explain other evidence, but I can't base a factual finding on the document. Do you have any objection to me receiving it with those limitations? No. Thank you. Exhibit 17 is received and will be treated as an administrative hearsay. Thank you. Any other uh, presentation of documents before we proceed with testimony of the petition. No presentation of documents. I would just ask to set a, a brief presentation of the legal standards of the hearing. All right. You can make that statement and then we'll take the petitioners to testimony. Uh, for the record, pursuant to Title 16 California Code of Regulations 1399.21, in order for a petitioner to establish the following uh, license, 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 that's a word, um, he must do, she must, he or she must do so by clear and convincing evidence pursuant to Hippard, H-I-P-P-A-R-D versus State Bar, 
um, without confirming that I had the certifications in my file. At the time, I was under a lot of pressure and I wanted to just make sure I wasn't late on sending my renewal. So I didn't do my diligence and find out exactly, you know, because I had been taking the courses every summer, all of my employers that I'd worked for in, during that time had provided continuing ed education to meet the requirements, including the CPR and first aid and the laws and ethics. And also, um, during that time, I had just been through a lot. Um, I just lost my home. I, my son had attempted suicide. Um, I had a miscarriage. And I had three uh, surgeries during this period. So when I got the renewal, I just was under stress. I checked it off and I sent it unknowingly that I didn't have, uh, I think I believe it was nine, six hours short of the 30 hours. Um, so then after that time went by, um, I'm not sure, I think I did receive the new license, but then I received a, an audit letter in March. So yeah, basically I, I said, well, okay, so I sent all the certs that I had. Um, I contacted my directors of rehab that I've been working for at the time to confirm dates and so I sent the packet. Well, it ended up being that it wasn't within the renewal period because it was actually the first time um, I had to renew my license with the competency requirements. I had never done it in the 10 or 12 years before, so I wasn't very diligent about the dates, so I did not have the 30 hours. So with that being said, um, basically I was contacted by, I do not remember her name at this time, um, for, like she told me that they were not accurate you know, that they were not fulfilled, the requirements were not fulfilled. So I said, well, then can I, you know, file a one-time exemption? And, you know, I did file that, I sent the letter, and it was denied because it was too late. You know, it was another thing that was just past the required time. So I said, I could take the hours this week. You know, I could get, I can finish all nine hours tomorrow. You know, I tried that approach, and I was still denied. Um, I sent the form, it's all a part of this whole thing I have all of the paperwork here as far as, you know, all the correspondence that I did make for that. Your Honor, so, it's outside the record that's actually set forth in the decision order and accusation um, set forth in 1D-2013-737-73. Uh, we're not here to relitigate the prior decision. Um, and so in terms of whether or not there were evidence at that time that would have been part of the decision, um, that evidence overrule the objection for the following reason. Uh, all that Ms. Polrag did was reference material that she's brought with her. She hasn't offered it into evidence, um, so there's no basis on which uh, to make a, uh, an objection that she's adding to the record at this point. So the objection to overrule Ms. Polrag may continue with your testimony. So with that being said, I was uh, told that it, I got could not have that exemption despite letters from my doctor, despite all of the things that I had described to them that I was going through at that time. Um, I was still denied, so basically that it was revoked. My license was revoked by the Physical Therapy Board. And I petitioned um, two years after the revocation because per the acts, sorry, it's all in my folder, it states that you can renew after two years if the board deems good cause. So that was again denied. So then I redid this last year. So basically after three years of revocation, I, that's why we are here and that's why we came in March to uh, continue the case and, and try to uh, reinstate because I had petitioned for that. Okay. Ms. Colbrack, any other information that you want to offer to the board in support of your petition today? Not this time. All right, uh, Ms. Colbrack, I'm actually going to take you back a little further. I, I want to talk to you uh, initially about the June 9, 2004 road rage incident. Uh, can you tell us what happened during that incident? Um, actually, the details were, uh, I believe it was a uh, disturbing the peace. And basically, a girl and I, she had, uh, yeah, now I remember. Okay, I left work and somehow I traveled in her lane. She was already in the lane and she was going so fast that I didn't see her. 
So I turned into the, the closest lane to the left, and she was she got over and she got next to me, and you know basically explicitly uh, gave me the finger. And at that point in my life, I just had a lot. Um, you know, I had a long day at work, and it just that was very offensive to me. So it turned into a match of you know, you know back and forth, and basically um, she pulled over, I pulled over. She got out of her car, came towards me. I went out, got out of the car, and she, I said, what is your problem? Or she said, what is your problem? I don't even remember, it was 15 years ago. So I can't remember the specifics, but it was just a little pushing match back and forth, and I left the scene, she left the scene. Um, it, it turned out to be a disturbing the peace, and there was no, it was a misdemeanor. You actually pled to a battery in that case, pursuant to 242, isn't that correct? I, I don't actually recall, I just know that I was charged with a misdemeanor. I don't know the fact. Um, it was battery. That's you signed a stipulation in that case? Sure, yes. You agreed to the facts? Yes. That were set forth in the accusation? Yes. And those facts included that you followed this person home and punched her in the stomach, is that correct? No, not the stomach, no. Punched her in the upper body with a closed fist? Actually, I just pushed her, and I walked away. I'm going to have you look at Exhibit 6 for me, page AGO 35. I did not kick her. I mean, I, I'm not. Okay. Ma'am, I'm going to read this to you. Starting at line 18, respondent followed the other driver home, yelled at her, and punched her in the upper body with a closed fist. When the victim backed away and then fell, the respondent kicked her several times in the upper body. Do you remember doing that? No. And I'm going to turn you to page EGO 40 in exhibit 6. You see where it says culpability? Yes. It says, respondent admits the truth of each and every charge and allegation in accusation number 1D 2006 64685. Do you see that? Yes. All right, I'm going to turn you now to uh, the page here. AGO 45. April 27, 2007, original signed by Natalie Fix. Do you see that? My signature or just the actual statement that says yes. original signed? Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's your testimony today that you never hit this person. I pushed her. That you I never kicked it. her? No. Do you have any remorse for that incident? Absolutely. And what remorse do you have? That I should have just laughed at her and waved at her and kept on going home. Before that, before that incident, did you also have a conviction for uh, pursuant to Penal Code 415, disturbing the peace? Go ahead, Kevin. Before that conviction uh, to the 242 misdemeanor battery, in 2005, did you also have a misdemeanor conviction for disturbing the peace pursuant to 415 from 2003? Yes. So this was the second time that you had engaged in uh, fighting, is that correct? Yes. Why do you engage in fighting, or why did you engage in fighting at those times? Probably because I was bullied as a child and probably didn't I have this thing on my shoulder that I feel like if someone's flipping me off, that means they want, they're engaging in me, and it's, I've learned my lesson. It's, that's been so many years ago. Um, I've been flipped off several times, and in fact, I was just flipped off by a 90-year-old lady crossing the street the other day, and I just waved at her. If your license is returned to you, you may work with patients that 
become angry with you based on the fact that you're having them do exercises, they may curse at you, they may flip you off. Can you tell the board how you will not engage in that kind of violence with patients? Yes. How is that? Just take it not personally and realize that it's just a, a hand movement, it's a gesture. And it has nothing to do with them trying to engage me, engage myself. All right, that decision was incorporated as part of the decision that would later be um, case 1D-2013-73773. Uh, do you see that on page, AGO 28, prior discipline, exhibit five? AGO 25? Yes. Uh, AGO, I'm sorry. Page, exhibit 5, AGO 28. I'm sorry, what was your question? The, the decision in exhibit 6 would be incorporated as a prior disciplinary decision in the decision that was issued on in 2013. Do you see that? Yes. And that was based on the fact that you had a conviction in 2005 for a misdemeanor 242 that we've been talking about. Correct. Let's talk about the 2013 decision. Uh, did you provide two falsely dated certificates to the board? No. You object to the finding in this decision in Exhibit 5 that you provided two falsely dated uh, certificates to the board? The dates were given to me by my director of rehab. And when I talked to Mark Felton on this case, he said that I couldn't bring other therapists into the case. I just needed to say that they were in the wrong dates. So you blame someone else for what occurred in, this, in the decision that's- No, uh, no, I'm, I'm responsible for it, for allowing them to, yeah, I'm responsible. So let's back up. You provided two certificates to the board when they asked for you to verify your completion that had dates on them that were incorrect. Is that correct? Yes. You're the one that provided those? Yes. You signed under penalty of perjury, they were accurate? Yes. And in fact, when the board went and verified whether you had completed those uh, courses, they had occurred at a much earlier time than the dates that were placed in the certificates. Correct. Is that correct? correct? Yes, that's why my license was revoked. Ms. Fulgrack, try not to speak over oh. the council. A, I want to make sure everyone hears everything, and B, I want to make sure we have a clear record mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, ma'am. And in addition to the two certificates with the forged or the incorrect dates, you also forged a certificate, did you not? Yes. It was a certificate that you had taken four hours of pain management care? Yes. Or tra uh, uh, training? Yes. And that certificate was a lie, is that correct? Yes. During the hearing, it's noted that at one point you testified that you received a discovery request from the board before the hearing, and that you read it, but didn't understand it. And then you testified later under oath that you never read it. Do you remember that part of the decision? No, I don't, but yes. During this decision, or during this hearing, did you lie about receiving the discovery request? and reading it and not understanding it, and then later saying that you never received it? Yes. Is it important for a physical therapist assistant to be truthful? Absolutely. Why? Because you're taking care of patients and um, you wanna be accurate and truthful and it's important to be accurate. What did you learn from this incident? Never to lie. About forging documents, what did you learn from this incident? Not to do that. Do you have any remorse for what happened in this decision that led to the revocation of your license? Absolutely. What type of remorse do you have? I'm very sad that I made such a huge mistake and I can't believe that how it has basically, you know, taken over the whole, uh, my whole life. 
was this a mistake or did you purposely forge a certificate and alter the dates on two certificates and provide those to the board? Not on purpose. I don't feel that I did. I just was under so much stress that I took the word of my director. Do you acknowledge that during uh, the initial hearing on this case in 2013, you failed to provide any evidence to corroborate all the difficulties that you testified about? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Corroborate means evidence that you used to back up your testimony, documentation of surgeries, documentation of your, of your, your son's suicide. Do you recognize that during the decision in this case, you failed to do that, provide any of that information? Um, no, I did provide all of that when I applied for the first time exemption and I have a doctor's note that the board received. It's not actually my question. You're gonna okay, to, sorry. I'll, I'll repeat my question to you. My question is not when you provided for the exemption, but when you actually went to hearing on this case, you failed to provide any of that information to the hearing officer, is that correct? Yes. In fact, it's set forth in finding four on page HEO 28 of exhibit five. Not a question, counsel, move on. Do you understand why your license was revoked? Absolutely. And what is your understanding? That I made a mistake, I was not diligent with my certificates, and I should have confirmed with all of the providers myself and not take the word of other people. And I asked this earlier, based on that response, do you believe this was someone else's fault? No, it's my fault. That's what I'm saying, I learned from that. Since your revocation, uh, what have you been doing to prevent uh, your, any anger issues that you might have had in the past? I attended the anger management. When was that completed? Um, back in 05. And what have you done since your license revocation to be truthful? Um, basically just being honest. Not uh, following through and being diligent with all of the things that I need, keeping accurate records, file systems. Did you attain an ethics class? Absolutely, yes. When did you do that? Um, I just have the certification from earlier this year, right before the March hearing. And I've taken one every year you know, since revocation. Let's talk about your reinstatement petition. I'm going to turn you to Exhibit 8. Did you recognize this? Yes. What is it? Letter of recommendation. And who's it from? Russell Lee. Is this his signature? I didn't witness him signing it. How did you receive this letter? From his uh, staff manager, or uh, office manager, rather. When did you receive it? 10.30 of 17. Prior to receiving this letter, had you communicated with him within the last two months? From today or from before the letter? I'll, I'll rephrase. Prior to October 30th of 2017, had you communicated with Mr. Lee in the prior two months before receiving this letter? Yes. Hey, Ma'am, I'm gonna remind you, you are under oath today. Yes. To counsel, the instruction is unnecessary. If you want her to be instructed about that, you can request me to do it. Thank you, Your Honor. Are you aware that he signed a declaration saying this letter is a fraud or a forgery? Yes. Are you aware that he said you made up volunteering in his clinic? Yes. Are you aware that he said he hasn't seen you since the early 1990s in his declaration? Yes. Is it still your testimony that this letter was provided to you from his office manager? Yes. Did you create this letter? No. 
turn you to Exhibit 13. recognize this letter? Yes. And how did you receive this letter? I requested um, for him to write me a letter of recommendation. He said for me to type it up and that he would sign it. Did he, direct, did he verbalize what the contents of the letter were going to be? Yes. I disclosed to him that my license was revoked and I needed a letter of recommendation. Did he, re did he have a chance to review your draft before he signed it? Yes. Did he make any changes? No. At the top of the letter it says, I am writing this letter for Natalie Colbrook. And it's signed by Les Dighton. Does it say in here that you were writing the letter on his, for him to sign? That was not a requirement, no. Um, is that line false then, that I am writing this letter for Natalie Colbrack, in your opinion? Yes. Now let's talk about the exemption. You applied for an exemption from the Physical Therapy Board, or an extension, I should say, an extension of time to provide certificates after you had already provided the two certificates with the forged or the incorrect dates and the forged certificate. Is that correct? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. At some point in your testimony, you stated that you asked for an extension of time from the board to provide uh, your competence uh, certificates. Uh, but I'm asking you, you asked for that, that extension of time only after you had already provided the board with two certificates with uh, incorrect dates that, you, that have been changed and a forged certificate. Is that correct? Yes. Do you think it would be reasonable for the board to deny your request for an extension after you had provided them with fraudulent documents? Can you repeat that? question is, do you think it would be reasonable for the board to deny your request for an extension after you had provided them fraudulent documents? Yes. I have no other questions for this witness. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's go to questions from board members. We'll start on my right. Hi, Ms. Galbraith. Thank you. Thank you for coming in today. Um, my first question you had to do a self-assessment of your demeanor, your present day, what would it be? What would it be? Confused? Um, overwhelmed? Could you pinpoint um, any reason for the confusion or, or feeling overwhelmed? Just why I made poor decisions and why I allowed my uh, stressors in my life to pick what I, bad decisions I made. Um, can you tell me the difference between road rage and disturbing the peace? Those are two different things, but if you can explain to me you know, the difference according to you, it might help me understand part of your testimony today. Yeah, I believe they're so long ago, I don't recall. Um, I remember the road rage, you know, the, the one with the, the incident where I had to go to court and they charged me with the battery. I recall all of that. And um, yeah, it just um, it's called a trigger. Like, it's something that I have to control. You know, like I was saying earlier, like if someone flips me off, I can just wave at them, laugh it off, and move on. Versus engaging with that, you know, just taking anger towards them. You know, I felt that they were just trying to, they were pissed off because I got cut, cut them off or whatever, you know, and I was like, I just don't feel that at that point in my life that that was a huge problem for me. I didn't care for it. It was my trigger. And since then, I've been flipped off thousands of times, and I just wave at them and laugh, you know. It's just something I had to get over. 
that was what, yeah, that leads to my next question. Why do you think you get flipped off so much? Is there something in the way that you drive, or do you have a lot of tickets, or can you? Honestly, uh, um, I, I have had a lot of tickets in the past. I probably haven't had a ticket in five or six years. Um, I never have had an accident. So I don't, it tend to, I don't um, attribute it to my driving skills, but I do attribute it to our society and just people have, you know, anger. And so if they're, if they're expressing it that way, I need to realize that it's just their gesture. That's the way they are telling me how they feel. And so you don't think that they, that their anger uh, is stimulating from you? Something that you've done? Your question, their anger what? Um, I'll, I'll rephrase. So, um, you think they're just angry and you have nothing to do with that anger? I believe I do not control other people's anger, yes. But I have to control my anger. Okay. Um, can you, I know that uh, the council had asked you this, but can you tell me the difference between making a mistake and uh, having a conscious decision to do something. Yeah, a mistake is when I checked the box and I didn't do my diligence to, to assure that I had those certificates in my possession and I had done them. Okay, and then my last question is, uh, I'm looking at the, the letters of recommendation that you submitted and uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Wade, Siani. Siani. Okay. Um, both of those letters are very similar uh, with grammatical errors, formatting errors, spelling errors. Were you aware no. of, of that? No. No. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you. I just had one question. Since your revocation, would you say that you have been completely, uh, behaved completely uh, in an ethical manner and was uh, truthful since really that, that moment where your license was revoked? I'm sorry, sir, I'm not hearing you well. Talk for truthful, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Um, so would you say that since your revocation, you have 100% of the time behaved ethically and have and truthful. Yes. Present. Yes. Good morning. I don't have a question written down, um, but I do have a question. Um, it, it troubles me that someone would um, have a license revoked because of continuing ed, but the bigger problem is the deception and the dishonesty. And so I just want to hear from you, why should we reinstate your license? Because I have learned greatly, I have great remorse, and I've um, understood that it was my, my fault. I take ownership of my mistake. And um, I, Aside from the the huge mistake that I made as a PTA, I was I never had problems as a PTA being honest in, in my charting, in my treating of patients. I never uh, harmed a patient. I never I've, I've, I've never had any complaints about my uh, abilities as a PTA. And um, I just feel that this was a, a huge wake up call, you know, as far as being honest and integrity and just knowing that I can't just make it to fake it to make it is, you know like a slang thing and um and since then I've been taking care of well we might talk about that later but um yeah so I just feel that um my character as a PTA and my uh ability to practice under the supervision of a physical therapist is still in me it didn't go away I just was in such under stress that I didn't do proper diligence to ensure that was accurate. Thank you. I can ask a question. Um, 
Fulbright, I'm looking at the decision from 2013 that led to the revocation of your license. Did you understand that one of the things you were found responsible for and one of the reasons for revocation was for a fraud that was substantially related to your qualifications, functions, and duties as a physical therapy assistant? Yes. Do you also understand that one of the causes for license revocation was for unprofessional conduct in the form of false representations? Yes. So you understood those yes. as being included in the reasons for revocation? Yes. Ms. Fulbright, as I look through your narrative statement attached to the petition, I don't see any reference whatsoever to fraud, false representation, dishonesty, or any reference to efforts you've made to address that. Can you tell me why that wasn't included in your narrative statement? I believe because I don't really know of a rehab center that relates to that. Like there's a California code about after revocation, the board shall provide rehab stipulations, and I never received any of that. So I just kind of did things on my own as far as taking – I've seen a therapist, a counselor. That's what I've been doing, and I did that – I've been doing that and still currently seeing one. So that was my rehab, you know, just talking with him and getting through why I wouldn't make that mistake and why I didn't understand the whole – all of the different factors relating to that revocation, you know, not just the checking of the box, you know, all of the certifications that were submitted. Okay. We have board member questions. Continue. Hi. So do you remember the first cause of – what the first cause of discipline was? I'm sorry? The first cause of discipline in 2013. Yes. Can you tell me what that was? The cause of the discipline? Yeah. The first cause of the discipline, the number one complaint. 498, the license by fraud? Yes. Fraud in procurement of a license. Yeah. That was – basically I was unaware that everything was inaccurate, and that's why it's called fraud. So now I understand. So at what point did you become aware that a fraud was committed? When I looked all of this – all of the things up myself, when I did the research, as far as contacting my directors of rehab and following through with the seminar providers. A lot of the seminars I attended were on service, like in service at the site where I was working. So one of those certificates was in 2008 that you resubmitted with the change of the dates. How do you make that mistake? Stressed. I guess I was stressed out. The requirement was for 30 credits. Right. And – but from – you said with your opening statement that I only shorted six hours. But when the board audited you, it was more than six. In fact, it was just half of the 30 hours that you've done based on the board's audit. Correct. Correct? Right. Which brings me to my final question, which is on the – one of your recent testimonials or references, he specifically pointed to that six hours. So did you have a conversation with him in which – where you told him that it was only six hours and that he never really saw any of the documents that proved that the board said that it was more like 15 hours? Right. Yes. So is it your understanding that you only needed six hours? That was my understanding. But as I reflect now that you're saying it, I still – I have to see it in front of me to be able to be accurate. But in my head, it was six hours. But if they would not accept certain ones, I understand that it could be more than that. So again, did you – if you had the stipulated settlement, right, the order, 
did you read that when it specifically was indicated that there was a 15 hour requirement yes. that you've only yes. met there? So why did you continue to tell everybody that it's six hours, including us here today? I guess of the mistake of the numbers, because it has been over five years now. Um, I haven't really reviewed it. I, I, I'm current with uh, continuing edu education as of now, but due to financial, I can't afford to get the certification. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This is not an easy thing. You just made a statement that you're current on all of your continuing education requirements, but you don't have certificates. Meaning, I'm uh, sorry. Go ahead. Meaning that I have studied, I have continued my education. You know, I have the actual all of the paperwork that goes with each course. You're allowed to get those, but you can't get the certificate unless you take the post test and pay for the, the actual class. Got it. So, so I'm current with the information, is what I mean. Thank you for that explanation. Have you taken any continuing education courses and received certificates that prove that, that, have, you, that you've completed them successfully? I have certificates in my notebook for law and ethics, because I, I, as I said, I did not have a professional income. So I could not continue my education and not knowing the status of my license, I couldn't continue, you know, I couldn't afford it. Do you think that that, that your completion of continuing education to be able to meet that requirement that I'm required to, to meet as a PT, the same number of hours um, that the other um, two physical therapists that are on the board are required to meet for the past two years before our licensure, do you think that the board should consider your reinstatement without having any continuing ed certificates to show that you successfully completed those courses? I have completed law and ethics, which is to me the, the root of all of this. You know, it's being truthful and honest and that I made sure I could afford that. So if I was reinstated, I'd absolutely take the courses, but it's financial. I've been taking care of my mother-in-law for the last two years, so I haven't had an income. Good morning. You mentioned previously that you had no complaints about your ability to practice as a PTA, no patients complained about the quality of care you were providing. Now, you mentioned that your character as a PTA has been sublime, superb, no errors, no um, issues with patients or your employers. But those characteristics aren't checked out the door when you leave the practice setting. Right. You are a PTA whether you're practicing or whether you're sitting in your car and driving. And the reason that we are concerned, well, I'm concerned, I can only speak for myself, is that we can observe that poor judgment has been exercised in the battery charge, the fraudulent documents that were provided to the board. And it makes us concerned that if you are under duress, perhaps if we did provide you with a license, you're saying that stress is what triggers you to make poor judgments. How can you assure us that should we give you an unrestricted license, that you would be able to deal with that stress? How, what tools do you have? Um, well, um, since revocation, as I said, I've been um, taking care of my mother-in-law for the last two years, and I was employed. I basically, you know, had gone through so many different jobs because I was trying to have a, a employment, have an income. So I did everything from assembly to caregiver to everything, but I still maintained my abilities to be honest during that time because of the mistakes <coughs> I made. And have, uh, as far as the, um, I'm sorry, can you rephrase that again? I mean, just the last part. Just what tools do you have to mitigate stress when it appears in your life? Um, well, uh, basically just talking with my therapist and um, having uh, coping skills. 
I have developed different coping skills like walking away, just taking deep breaths. Um, I have different ways of dealing with stress and not allowing it to trigger my upsetness or anger or disorientation as far as uh, following through on what I need to do, being diligent. Okay. Now, despite everything that has happened in your past, as you sit before us today, do you consider yourself a person of integrity? Absolutely. Do you consider yourself an honest person? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Let me go back to the board members see if there's any follow-up. So, um, clearly, your honesty is being called into question, and, and not just with us. It sounds like you're figuring out how to be honest with yourself. Am I correct? Yes. So, I want to know, were you aware that Monty would be um, following up and verifying all of your letters of recommendation and your um, references? You Absolutely, were, yeah. How did you feel when you found out that, that Russell Lee denied knowing you or even approving a letter of recommendation to be written? I felt there was a conflict of interest. Um, he even stated that he never employed aides and I was his aide. So I just took that into consideration that he's not recalling things. He's older now. He was at the time. The first letter of recommendation came back in 2016 and he had had knee surgery. And, you know, maybe he was under medication or things that we would have forgotten, but I don't know. At any time, did you reach out to him? After? Yes, every time, and then he became unavailable. He never oh, so you never had a chance to talk oh, to him? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. We're not having a conversation. It has to be question and answer, and you have to wait for the question to finish and the answer to finish before you go on. We're not standing in the hallway just chatting with each other. So let's start with board member questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so you were not able to have a conversation with him after you found him. Correct. Okay. Ms. Colbert, if the board does reinstate your license, there's two options. One, it could be reinstated fully without any restrictions, or it could be reinstated on probation with restrictions. Which do you think would be appropriate? Probably probation, just to continue monitoring and ensuring that I'm, you know, following the guidelines. And do you have a sense as to what kind of restrictions should maybe be placed on your license? Well, at the beginning of this, I felt that it should have been a, a fine or a probation to begin with, so I don't really know how I could say that, but um, I would say just having uh, supervision by PT in a uh, skilled nursing and or hospital setting. Maybe no home health, you know, no you know, autonomous type positions.
Please have a seat. And please state and spell your name for the record. My name is Monty Martin, M O N N Y, last name M A R T I N. Thank you, Mr. Martin. And uh, we'll get questions first from Mr. Gotcha, then Ms. Colbrack. If you have any questions for Mr. Martin, you may ask. And we'll allow, uh, obviously, questions from board members. Go ahead, Counselor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Martin, where are you currently employed? Physical Therapy Board of California. And in what role are you employed? I am the probation monitor. As part of being the probation monitor, do you do investigations of petitions for early termination of probation and petitions for reinstatement of licensure? Yes. What does that investigation consist of? Uh, it consists of uh, calling people that have written letters of recommendation for petitioners asking them questions about the uh, truthfulness of the letter, whether or not they wrote the letter, that kind of thing. Do you also have a chance to call a petitioner so that you can identify their voice? Yes, they are also interviewed as part of the process. Are these done in person or usually over the phone? Usually by phone. How long have you been doing these types of investigations? Approximately 2007. Um, you've been sitting here next to me as we've gone through the exhibits uh, that are in this exhibit binder, and you've also had a chance to review the exhibits uh, before uh, that we went on the record today. Do you recognize all the documents that are contained in this exhibit binder? Yes. And are you familiar with them? Yes. And how are you familiar with them? Um, well, some of them I prepared and I read others. I want to just take us to Exhibit 8. Um, can, you, can you go to that page? Do you recognize this? Yes. And what is this? Uh, this is a recommendation letter that was submitted by Ms. Colbrack as part of her petition that was scheduled in March. It's a, re a letter supposedly written by Russell Lee. Did you have a chance to contact Mr. Lee? I did. And when you contacted, uh, I'm sorry, is he a Dr. Lee or Mr. Lee? Doctor. When you contacted Dr. Lee, um, did he show any signs of dementia? No. Was he unable to understand and answer your questions that you posed to him? No. Did he appear to be impaired when you talked to him? No. What did he relate to you about whether or not he provided a letter of recommendation to respondent or to petitioner in this case? said he had not provided a letter of recommendation for her. Was he surprised to be contacted by you? Yes. How do you know that? Um, he seemed genuinely confused as to why I was contacting him. When I brought up Ms. Colbrack's name, he had no idea who that was. And when did you have that conversation? Um, that took place on January 10th and a follow-up conversation on January 11th of this year. Excuse me, um, Mr. Martin, to answer that question, was it necessary for you to refer to your report to get the actual dates? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. And for the record, he's referring to Exhibit 10 at page 62. Thank you. Um, after, when you talked to him on the second day, um, did you have a conversation with both he and his office manager? Yes. And what did he relate to you about um, your request for verification regarding a letter of recommendation, um, the letter in the exhibit eight? He said he didn't write it. Did he have a chance to see the letter at some point? Yes, after we spoke, um, he asked if I would fax him the letter, and I said I would. And when you faxed the letter, um, uh, did he get back to you about whether or not he wrote that letter? Yes, he said he did not write the letter. Um, exhibit 11, um, do you have that? Yes. Have you seen that? Yes. It's a declaration signed by Mr. Lee um, from this year um, verifying that he didn't sign the letter. Uh, do you recognize this declaration? Yes. My office drafted this declaration and then you actually received it from Mr. Lee? Correct. And he signed it under penalty of perjury? Yes. During the conversation on January 11, 2018, 
did he play a voicemail for you from uh, the petitioner? Yes. And what was the nature of the voicemail? Um, it was uh, Ms. Colbrack asking him to write a letter of recommendation for her. Who did the voicemail, who would have been left with? I believe it was left with the office manager. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Left with whom? The office yeah. manager. Yeah. And was that, was that voicemail left after uh, the October 2017 date on Exhibit 8? Yes. In the voicemail, um, what was the request of Ms. the petitioner? That Dr. Lee write a letter of recommendation for her. Do you know when that voicemail was left? January 11, 2018. The time that you were trying to verify whether or not the October 2017 letter was accurate? Yes. Based on your conversations uh, with uh, Dr. Lee and his declaration, uh, did you come to a conclusion regarding the Exhibit 8? I did. And what was that? Uh, that the letter was forged. I want to talk to you now about uh, the Staidi letter, and I need to just see the front here. Exhibit uh, 13. Do you recognize this? Yes. And in the letter, does it say that the individual signing it wrote the letter? Top page. Oh, yes. Did you have a chance to talk to this individual to verify whether he wrote this letter? Yes. And what did he tell you? He told me that Ms. Colbrack wrote the letter, he briefly read it, and then he signed it. When you were discussing this letter with him, um, how did he how did you respond to your questions? Um, so initially, over the phone, um, he said that he ho he had wrote the letter um, of his own free will and volition, and um, I recognized that some of the language in the letter was similar to uh, Dr. Lee's letter and it gave me some pause as to whether or not he wrote it. So during the conversation, I was reading excerpts of the letter to him, and the further I went down the letter, the less certain he got that he wrote the letter. At some point, did he start changing his answers from yes to another response? Yes. And what was the response? Um, it kind of changed to I'm not sure it's possible that I wrote that. When did you have this conversation with him? And you can refer to your report, I believe it's the last exhibit if you need to, and that's exhibit 17 that refreshes your recollection of the court's permission. Yeah. May 15, 2018. And when was the letter supposedly written by Dr. Uh, Zaidi? March 1st, 2018. Did you find it strange that a letter that he supposedly wrote himself would be having a hard time remembering the contents only a couple months later? Yes. Did you discuss the filing system that's described in the letter um, of, of March of 2018? I did. And when you asked him about the filing system that he had wrote about, what did he tell you about that? Um, he said he was unaware of the filing system. then asked him if a filing system would be the kind of thing he wrote about in a recommendation letter, and he said he could not remember, and then read the paragraph that mentions the filing system directly to him. After I finished reading the paragraph, he stated he believes he could have written the paragraph, but he wasn't sure if he had. Um, at that point, I asked him if I could email him the letter so he can verify his signature and that it was authentic, and he said, would do that. 
after you had a conversation with him, did he uh, send you an email? Yes. Turn to the last page of the exhibit binder. Do you recognize that? Yes. And this is page AGO 91. What is this? This is the email that Mr. Stiavi sent me after our conversation. And in this email, what did he tell you? Uh, he says uh, he did not write the recommendation letter. The letter was presented to him by Natalie. He read it, agreed to the letter, and signed it. He also verified the signature was his, but the verbiage was not his. All right, let's talk about the homework letter. And I believe that's exhibit uh, 15. When you talked to uh, uh, person Howard, uh, were they aware that the respondent had had their her license revoked? No. When you talk, uh, let's talk about the Nelson letter, and that's exhibit Actually, I guess that's a personal reference that you contacted. Um, did that person indicate whether they were aware that uh, petitioner's license had been revoked? They were not aware. When you talked to uh, Dr. Torres, um, was Dr. Torres aware that petitioner's license had been revoked when providing the letter? Did he know why the license was revoked? No. It hadn't been explained to him by the petitioner that, uh, that she had fraudulently created documents and given them to the board? No. Why did he think the license had been suspended? monitor for the board, uh, do you monitor people whose licenses are on probation? Yes. And as part of that, uh, what, what do you do? What are your duties? Um, I contact probationers minimum, minimally on a quarterly basis and go over their terms and conditions of probation with them and whether or not they're complying with them. As part of your contact with probationers, does it require the probationer to be truthful with you when you're contacting them? Yes. Why is that? Um, oftentimes, because I'm not at their place of employment, it would be impossible for me to know whether or not they're compliant all the time. Based on your investigation as part of this petition for reinstatement, do you have an opinion as to whether this petitioner would be a good candidate for a probationary license? I do. And what is that opinion? That she would not be. And why is that? Uh, because it's very important that uh, a probationer be honest and truthful with us. I have no further questions to this witness. Thank you. Ms. Colbrack, if you have any questions for the witness, you may ask. Um, actually, I believe as part of the requirement um, for um, asking or requesting for letters of recommendation that you should have each one of them read the disclosures. And with my, with my, uh, Letter writers, they all knew that my license was revoked. Otherwise, why would I be trying to reinstate it? So uh, let, me, let me interrupt you for the following reason, Ms. Polbrecht. 
Right now, the witness is under oath to provide testimony. So you're making a statement to us. Okay. And what, uh, we can consider okay. that as part of your testimony. Okay. Uh, but it's Mr. Martin who's under oath, who's given direct testimony, and you have the opportunity to ask questions of him if you have any. So we'll give you that chance to ask questions. If you want to make a supplemental statement, we can consider that later. But right now, if you have any questions of Mr. Martin, you should ask him. Uh, Monty, were you, um, did you personally meet with Russell Lee? Not in person, no. Okay. Did you uh, meet um, Lindy Nelson, the person who referenced? Not in person, no. And did you say that I, um, that Lindy wrote a letter of recommendation, or was that a personal reference? Did you refer to, to a letter? I don't recall if Lindy wrote a letter from her. Council. Nelson is listed as a professional reference. That's all. Any other questions? No. Let me see if any board members have questions for Mr. Martin starting with my opinion. So I have a question that's lingering. Um, it appears, and I would like you to answer this, that it seems like everybody in your orbit. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you appear to be addressing a question to Ms. Colbert. Okay, yeah. It's not Hirsch who's under oath at this point, it's oh. Mr. Martin. I will give board members, first of all, give Ms. Colbert an opportunity to make any further statement, and then board members can ask her question. I'm sorry I have to make no, no. some rules. Absolutely. Any questions from Mr. Martin? Yes, I okay. actually. Go ahead. Your conversation with. Uh, the reference Mr. Steyard, when you, sp when you spoke to him and you pointed to him being surprised, can you explain to me how that conversation, you know, bring me into the space where, how that conversation took place? Are you referring to Dr. Stiati or? Stiati. Mr. Stiati, Stiati or Dr. Lee? This, uh, both of them actually. First Dr. Lee okay. and then Dr. Stiati. So the way the conversation with Dr. Lee went was I read his letter and its procedure to contact uh, people that write letters. Um, and during that process and just calling him to do an interview with him, he, most of the times when I call somebody, they're already aware that I'm gonna be calling. When I tell them who I am, they know who I am and he had no idea who I was or why I was calling. And as I explained it to him, he, he said he hadn't been involved in this process at all. And he had not written a letter of recommendation for Ms. Colbrack. Um, for Mr. Stiati, uh, it was a little bit different. Things started out normally enough. I read the letter, it, some of the, the wording in the, in the letter struck me as odd because it was very similar to the letter Dr. Lee uh, submitted, specifically about the filing system that Ms. Colbrack was keeping. It just struck me odd that two recommended, recommenders would add that in there because it doesn't seem important to the process. So um, that gave me some pause and made me think I should make sure that he wrote the letter himself. As I began asking him questions, he became less and less sure that he wrote the letter. And after our conversation ended, he sent me an email saying he would like to speak further 
We then had a, a phone call between us and he stated he did not write the letter, but he had signed it and, and wrote it and that Ms. Col and read it and that Ms. Colbrack had actually written it. Dr. Lee is how his name was written, and I said Mr. Stiati. I'm not sure I'm if he's sorry, a doctor. I'm not hearing you. Dr. Lee said what? I referred to Dr. Lee, and he referred to himself as Dr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Stiati, I'm not sure if he's a doctor or not. Any nothing other questions? Else. Nothing Mr. else. Mr. Mark, I want to thank you for your testimony, and we'll excuse you for the testimony. Uh, it's my impression, Ms. Colbrack, that you would like to uh, make further statements to the board. Is that correct? The, the final, yes. Well, yes. All right. Um, Mr. Gosh, I'm going to consider this as further testimony because Ms. Colbrick began to offer information a few moments ago that might be considered testimony. So, what I intend to do is reopen your testimony, allow further questioning once we've concluded with your testimony, and once I'm sure there's no other evidence, then I can take final argument. time that I checked the box for my renewal, I was dishonest, but at the time I was going through a lot of stress and I have learned from my mistake and wish to continue to practice under the supervision of a physical therapist as a PTA. Thank you. Mr. Gosh, I don't believe there was anything new in the nature of the testimony in there. I don't think it's necessary to allow cross-examination. I would agree with that. All right. And therefore, I don't think further questions from the board would be appropriate either. Ms. Colbrack, I appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Gottschett, is there any closing statement you would like to make? Well, first, let me make sure that we've got all the evidence in that you intend to present. Each of the documents has been received with two reports from Mr. Warren received as administrative hearsay. Is that correct by your understanding as well? Yes. Very good. All right, Mr. Gottschett, if you have a closing statement, you may go right ahead. And I'm, I'm assuming that was the petitioner's closing statement. I'll give her the opportunity to respond because she does bear the burden of proof but I would consider her last statement as her initial closing statement. Thank you, Your Honor. Attorney General's office in this uh, proceeding is to protect the public, and that's what we're here for, representing the public, whether or not this board determines to grant grant licensure. Uh, the evidence in this case is uh, very concerning uh, because this is a petitioner who is before this board uh, whose license was revoked for perpetrating fraud on the board. And that's what forgery of a certificate is. That's what forging dates on a certificate is. Uh, and that was noted in the 2013 decision that uh, by the uh, administrative law judge, which became the decision in this case, that she showed no remorse, no insight, and lacked any sort of consideration regarding um, what her actions meant. Um, when you take into consideration that she has an anger problem, which was uh, disciplined um, in a further time ago, um, you take her dishonesty, couple that with that, um, in order for her to uh, prevail today, she needs to prove by clear convincing evidence that she's fully rehabilitated and that these issues will never occur again. Um, unfortunately, during this uh, investigation by the board in this matter, and as testified by Mr. Martin, uh, we now have additional evidence of fraudulent documents being perpetrated on the board. Um, it is uh, remarkable that um, she is still Tischer still is not showing insight into the fact that the Russell Lee letter um, is a forgery. Um, and so, uh, based on the evidence that's here, um, and based on the evidence that's been presented by Mr. Martin, and also the declaration of Mr. Lee, or Dr. Lee, which was fully admitted into evidence and is before the board, uh, the Attorney General's office position is that this petition for rehabilitation should be denied. Thank you. Ms. Colbrack, any concluding statements you'd like to make as part of the record today? No. Right. Ms. Colbrack, I want to thank you for coming today and for presenting your testimony. Mr. Gottschett, I very much appreciate your efforts in getting paperwork in and other evidence submitted. 
At this point, we'll consider the case as being under submission, and the record will be closed. Thank you all for the record. Again, the court reporter has an information sheet that will take a few minutes to fill out. My credit report is going to take a few So once the paperwork has been completed, I will pass the control back to the president of the court. Can you guys hear me? That's better. Any um, edits or amendments for page nine? Page 10? Page 11? Page 12. for page 12, page 13. Page 14. Page 15. Page 16. Page 17. Actually, when they came up to the dais, I see. and they were okay. confused based on the title of one of the regulatory packages that we were reviewing, mm -hmm. that it referred to business that they were interested in speaking about. I see. I remember that now. Okay. And they came up at the end mm -hmm. for public comment. Okay. Uh, page 18. Page 19. Page 20. Page 21. Page 22. Page 23. And then finally, page 24. So 
so then I will be looking for a motion from one of the members to adopt the minutes as amended with a correction on um, line 111, correcting the date range 25 through 37. So moved. still in the works. We are down to three different venues, but I don't have a commitment from any of those three. Okay. Would that be for September or December? That's for the December date. September is in Sacramento. September is in the hearing room at the Evergreen Building, uh, Department of Consumer Affairs in Sacramento. Okay. So, 2018 meeting adopted the calendar still looks good. PTA conference is planned for October 12th and 13th. Um, this next year's meeting is going to be a tri-state conference um, uh, with uh, Nevada and Arizona, and it will be held in Las Vegas. So it's uh, a first attempt at this kind of a, this kind of an event, and. I know that the CPTA is very excited about it. Um, we may hear more of it tomorrow when they present their report as well. A lot could um, change between now and then, but if things stay status quo, that's probably not going to be one that we're going to be able to participate in with a booth and an outreach attempt, um, being that it's out of state for one, and currently there's still a restriction on out of state travel, which is an executive order. But that, like I said, might change with the changing of administration. Um, but Las Vegas is always problematic for state entities to attend conferences and those kind of things. So, being more than a year away, I'm sure we can. We'll keep our fingers crossed. I'm hoping we can work something out. Any other comments on the proposed 2019 meeting calendar? new topic items on this executive officer's report, but I'm going to go through them um, as they're listed in the report. Um, as you're aware, we were you know, trying to focus our resources to um, address some outreach issues that we had, and so we established a position that we called the Outreach Liaison. Um, I'm sad to say that that position is now vacant again, um, and in, in trying to reestablish it, we decided to um, refer to it as the communication and education analyst, um, but we are recruiting that position right now. We've had interviews and we're in the selection of a, a few different candidates, so um, we'll look forward to that. But I think you, you'll see through the rest of the materials that having somebody sit in that position had quite an impact. You'll see when we get to the outreach report and some of those other things and publications and those kind of things that it did really make a difference, so we're hoping to go back to that. Um, in under animal rehabilitation. Um, there's not really a lot to report to this board. Uh, there was some legislation that we'll address tomorrow morning in, in Brooke Arneson's report. 
Um, but of note is um, that board has replaced their executive officer and has appointed Jessica Sieferman as their new um, executive officer and she starts um, first week of July. And so I'm sure that we'll have um, communication with them just establishing that rapport and that relationship and keeping up to speed. They still currently have um, regulations for animal rehab that are in the promulgatory process. So we're, we're keeping an eye on those and seeing where they are in the, in, on, the, on the calendar anyway. Um, for the DCA internal audit, we just responded to um, the 180 day response and the progress that we've made. We have uh, one of their auditors coming out to our suite next week to address that and, and go over those. And so we'll continue to work on that. Um, the newest thing I think it, we haven't really discussed before is um, the need or the necessity for um, the PTBC suite and its relocation. Um, we've grown to a point where we're busting at the seams and the, where our suite was designed for 13 people, we now have 25. Um, and so that's going to necessitate a move. We are uh, in the 11th hour in the lease negotiating process. Uh, the current lease soft term expires in March of next year, and that's after it's been extended twice. Um, so we're going to be looking at either a space outside of our existing suite to move to, or even within the same building, maybe upstairs or something like that. But more than anything, just to have more square footage. Right? So a couple more cubicles, spread people out. Right now we're walking over each other and boxes stacked in hallways and those kind of things. So it makes it a little difficult. Um, as part of our lease negotiation, it's been revealed to us in April of this year that the Department of General Services has a, a larger plan in mind for um, not only the PTBC, but the Department of Consumer Affairs and even um, businesses services, um, business services and housing agency. Consumer services and housing agency. Um, and relocating all of us to a single location in Sacramento um, that will be a million plus square feet by the year 2025. Um, so that kind of changes the strategy and how we negotiate a lease where we are now. You typically, you know, it's an eight-year lease, four years of a hard term, and four years of a soft term. 2024, 2025 would put us just inside of the, the soft term. So we'll be able to move on calendar, assuming that that project stays on calendar itself. Um, it's right now a, a building that still needs to be demolished surveyed out and then new construction so there's a lot of time in between now where things could change the project could change the administration is changing and so those priorities might change as well but it's something that we kind of need to keep an eye on as far as where we plan on moving to in the future and then if so um, what does the move look like in the immediate future <laughs> so the move in the immediate future is kind of it's uncertain um, we would be asked to extend um, our lease or at least sign a new lease in the same building. Um, and the idea of moving anywhere else would be, wouldn't be very probable. Um, staying where we are now, we have a very reasonable square footage um, rate. Uh, there are 10 boards inside of our building. And so for 10 of us to move in all different directions or 10 of us to find um, space in another area is unlikely. Um, and we'd be encouraged to stay where we are with this new move you know, coming up on the calendar with the idea of the DGS 10-year um, sequencing plan. So more than likely, this time next year, I would, I would estimate we would probably initiate a move upstairs. So there'll be a period of time where we would be on a month-to-month -month lease, you know, but the amount of time that it takes to plan um, in-state service to make that kind of move is usually about a year to, six, a year to 18 months. And so we're discussing it now, so this time next year we possibly could be moving, but probably the latter part of 2019. So, and we desperately need to do it. And then if, I, if you have any questions on anything in the report. Definitely exceeded the estimated 
time, um, both in the audit itself, but also now it just kind of, the 180 day response and 365 day response were always part of the process, but because it took longer for the initial audit to be completed, we're still there. Um, but as we work through it, I know that some of the other delays were caused by audits being done on other boards also. So while they're auditing this board, we're not the only board. So they're separating their work out among staff as well. Any other questions for Jason from the board? Any public comment? So I, one, I think this is the, in the materials, this is the first time that you've seen um, what the plan will well, be close to, similar to what it's going to look like. It has not been skinned, it has not been themed in our um, design form <coughs> or style guide, so this is just the draft. Um, and so today, it's really um, up to the members to decide if this is what we move forward with, and if we adopt this plan as it is, we would send it on to uh, publication design and editing. They would beautify it, put it into a publishing form, and then we would uh, adopt it. Um, well, you would adopt it in its form now, but keeping in mind that it's going to look much prettier and much more presentable after the adoption. How much prettier can it get? Um, I think um, more than just white paper and blueprint. Uh -huh. It's going to have very similar to uh, what you remember our old strategic plan or even our newsletter formatting. So it'll have the same style application. So what do you need from us today? So here I am looking for a member to uh, provide a motion to adopt this, unless there are any edits or amendments that we think uh, need to be discussed. Do you want to go page by page? Starting with the table of contents. Moving on to the list of members. Message from the president. The about the board. Strategic goals. Our mission, vision, and values. The standard for consumer protection in physical therapy, or should we say, uh, be the standard for, or the standard? I was going back and forth, and I thought, no. I remember the conversation going back and forth quite a bit. Good. Um, yeah, we go again. Yeah, well. Could be opening that door, um, but the ultimate decision that day was to adopt the standard for consumer protection of physical therapy. But again, that's why we're here now. Part of my recall was that because this, it's understood that this is a vision of this board. Yes, and to say that we are the standard for consumer protection and physical therapy was, was the decision about where we wanted to go with, with what that, that phrase was. And so that we are, we are the example, we are the standard. And yeah. there's, a, there's a matter of tense also, so in the yeah. kind of a plan, and with the the, it's we stating are. currently. I like the the, the, the that statement. So anything else for mission, vision, and values? No, but can we go back? Sure. Sorry. So I was just looking at, you know, the physical therapy board of California and this um, board member's name and the vice president and members. Um, and then the message from the president, which is typical of strategic. Mm -hmm. I just want to bring 
bring up that it is the strategic plan was um, a small labor of love on behalf of all of us, and it's a message for me. But I just feel that it's also it should be from the board, and I don't know how the board members feel about that. But I would love a picture of the board members instead of just myself. Yeah. I just like to, to reflect like a collaborative effort. Okay. Not necessarily yeah. be called out. You know, I don't mind putting a message from the president, but uh, I think all of us should take credit for it. Um, and there are a couple ways I think that we can address that. So the page prior to the message, um, the president's message, we could do either a group photo or individual headshots next to names. So I'm hearing no headshots, and I'm seeing head shaking when I say headshots. So four out of Six of voters at this point. <laughs> I think it's a good idea, it's different. But I, I definitely think that, like you said, it's a labor of the board in its entirety. Mm -hmm. um, and while the names are listed here, um, I think it, it creates an archive better than just the name could. I just, where's, I just saw a picture of all of us, and I'm trying to remember Progress notes. Just here. Um, because otherwise I was thinking, how do we get Dr. Albiso back for a group photo? Sure. We, and I'm sure that we yeah, could. Yeah, that's a really good point. We, we could do that. Mm -hmm. But we also have. That's a really good We point. also have this photo of progress notes. So, so keep this in mind, too. Um, we could. Our next available opportunity um, would be the September meeting. And that's assuming that her calendar would allow for it for a photo op. Um, at the same time, that's a, a long time to wait to adopt the calendar, get it published, and, and out into the, you know, the hands of the licensing population and the public. Um, the picture that is in the newsletter, if it's suitable, we could use that as well. Um, and then I could go back to the headshot idea and have each member submit their own headshot for purposes of use from PD&E. <laughs> I like that idea. Like the yearbooks. <laughs> it would kind of look like a yearbook. <laughs> it would kind of look see. like a yearbook. I felt like I was going to the moon. <laughs> well, I would propose to keep up. I would propose to keep up. So using that, that very first page, that lists all of your names as particip participating in this process, having a picture of the group, and then her, your picture next to the president's message. Okay. And we want to use the, the same picture that was used in the newsletter so that Debra, Dr. Deborah Alviso is included as well. I think so. Unless you have another somewhere, which I'm guessing there might be. I might have, it was in that same session, but it might have a slightly different pose to it, so we'll look. Not one from one of the staff lunches no. with lays and nothing like that. Assorted, no, okay. Thank you. So, um, picking back up with mission, vision, and value. Any comment or suggestion? Goal two under licensing. Goal three, communication and education. Under 3.5, um, I was wondering about the ordering of the examples. And to put, my preference would be to put the, the board website as first, okay. um, rather than putting an outside um, uh, entity first. Um, following suit with that thought, 
blast over the social medias? I would. That's where my, that's where my thought would go. Okay. for communication education. Okay, goal four, organizational effectiveness. Any edits or comments for strategic plan methodology? I move we adopt the proposed strategic plan as amended. Motion by Ms. Ellaby, second by Mr. Watkins. Any further discussion by the board? Dr. Dominguez, you have some discussion? No, I'm ready to say hi. Oh. <laughs> The only discussion that I would have would be under goal three, communication and education, provide relevant, timely, and accurate information to consumers, licensees, and other stakeholders. I don't know if it belongs here, I just don't think it belongs anywhere else, but um, where would we, and this would probably be a detail, not necessarily a goal, but which one of these five sub-goals or six sub-goals would it fit for responding to um, incoming calls and emails and, and things like that in a timely manner? Probably 3.5, using existing technologies to enhance communication, education and communication, maybe? I think it might be a combination, right? So I also think 3.4 um, speaks to that as well, developed mm -hmm. and adopted communication and education strategy to inform all stakeholders about the regulation of the Profession. Um, essentially, though, when we when it comes to whether or not um, we are able to address the volume of phone calls coming in, um, I'm not nece I'm not necessarily sure that that needs to be identified in a strategic plan. It should right. be a common goal, um, and it's something that we try to address just in the proper staffing levels and those mm -hmm. kind of things. So. Um, I and I think, and I think 3.1 is the the kind of the gist of that established position authority and resources to make sure that we can address all of those um, issues identified through our research of doing this plan. Yeah. Any further board discussion? Any public comment? Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> Jameson's uh, physical therapy speaking as a licentiate, an at-large person, not representing any organization or school. Um, just in my communications with other licentiates, uh, the enforcement, the goal number one, um, just not knowing and or the speed of which complaints that are filed get dealt with. You know, um, I hear horror stories of a person who has on Megan's list and yet nine months later they're still treating the kids and stuff like that. So if, if that, that is a real important component, if you can, you know, kind of put some, you guys are really looking at it, but I just wanted to say thank you for doing it and, and hopefully something can get done to make that faster. Thank you. Okay. Roll call vote. Katarina Ellaby. Aye. Daniel Drummer. Aye. TJ Watkins. Aye. Alicia Rubina, amen. Aye. Jesus Dominguez. Aye. Tanya McMillian. Aye. And the vote is unanimous. Yes. Vote is unanimous. Motion's passed. And 
Agenda item number 10, public comment on items not on the agenda. Anything from the board? Anything from the public? Yes. Good afternoon, James Sims again, uh, speaking as licensee test. Looking at some of the statistics um, and just loving this profession and um, kind of uh, um, having seen what, what's happening out there, the, the discrepancy between the passing rate of physical therapists taking the scientific the NPT exam versus the laws and regs, uh, the numbers I got just from the, the book today. 84, 87 percent uh, versus just 60, uh, 75, and 79 percent, respectively. Uh, what is the opinion of the board if they could comment, if it's in order, uh, your off the cuff kind of comments, why there's a discrepancy between the passing rate of the uh, clinical side of it versus then the laws and regs? Both are impediments to being able to practice. And I'm wondering where maybe education institutions or just the uh, persons who are taking their own opportunity to study for the respective tests are, are falling short on the, the laws and regs. I'm just curious what your guys, what your opinion is. Mm -hmm. I have a, a general informational response to that if council will allow it. Okay. Um, it's something that comes up quite often, but I think um, one of the greatest contributing factors to that is that our applicants have spent years in education towards the art and science of physical therapy, and so they're much better prepared. Um, for the MPTE. When it comes time for the California law exam, um, there's a, a disconnect in um, our requirements is through our application process and what's taught in the actual schools. So the CAPTI accreditation process doesn't require any particular school to teach about the California laws, assuming that those applicants might go on to work in other jurisdictions. Um, so they get very little when it comes to that. When we do outreach campaigns, we try to focus in on that and really kind of um, inform the students to really take that exam seriously, study for it the same way they would study for the MPTE. And we can see in the first time pass rates that it is lower and it's much better in the second time because once they fail it, they don't, they don't kind of sleep past it. They really look at it at that point, study it, and then they're successful. Um, and then the other part I think informationally for applicants to understand is that the California law exam was developed in very much the same fashion that the MPTE was fashioned. It's psychometrically sound. We, re we utilize subject matter experts to come in and help us do that after an occupational analysis. And so the questions are um, in, in many ways just as difficult as the questions on the MPTE. And so I think part of it is just um, on their first attempt maybe a lack of studying. Um, study it a little bit, and it's an awful lot to study. I mean, once they, once they fail at that first time, that second time, that second go around, it becomes much clearer for them. I think um, CAPTI does have some um, criteria, criteria, criteria for professionalism in knowing your state laws or regs in that sense. Uh, I think they do, you know, do whatever they need to do to satisfy that CAPTI yeah. accreditation. I'd like to applaud this board for at times, and, and I'm continuing to try my way to get you guys to these venues where you're at today, these universities where uh, there are entry-level educational programs that they'll recognize and value. So that way, some of the hearings that had to occur this morning can never ever are necessary to occur again. You know, stuff like that would be a great thing to do that in terms of the PR that this profession has. And I'd like to thank the board and applaud you guys for coming down to the various places that, uh, not that it's always taken advantage of <laughs> or taken an opportunity, but um, still I, I'm not going to stop trying to facilitate that from occurring. So, so yeah, I just, I saw the discrepancy there and I kind of, boy, how come, and, and, and I hope that the students recognize and the new professionals recognize, you don't pass either one of those, you still don't get a license. Mm -hmm. so, so you can learn all your brachial plexuses all you want, mm -hmm. but if you don't know how many aids you can supervise, you're not getting a license. And right. either one's going to stop you from income, pay off your student loans.
Thanks, guys. We certainly appreciate it. And it might be like a shameless plug, but we have uh, of late offered it out. Any institution that would like us to come out and, and do an outreach presentation focusing in on laws and ethics and what governs their practice in the state of California, we're willing to do it. Any other public comment for items not on the agenda? Okay, and that's going to conclude our agenda for today, except for some additional closed session items. And so it looks like we'll be due back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So we'll go into recess and then close after closed session. Yeah, so then we go into